We're going to get started here. Uh, welcome everybody to the June 20th Fairfield RTM committee meetings. Can we please stand for the pledge? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll hop right into it with uh, agenda order number four, four, which is presentation one tonight, tax relief for elderly and disabled report with the assessor Ross Murray. Ross, thanks for coming. You have to hold the button down the whole time. Sorry, we're not fancy over here. It's not like town hall. Okay, I, I won't read through the whole report, but I'll give you the highlights. Um, we are down this year again. Um, Dollar-wise, we're down $161,570. And um, count-wise, we're down 47 people overall in the program. We had uh, we have 1,090 on the on the program for this year. We took in 669 apps and 164 new apps, which was up quite a bit from prior years. Um, we still only have two people on the deferral program, and there's no still no freeze takers, so that re program rema program remains empty. Um, this year we did do a mailing to about a thousand residents. Uh, we purchased a mailing list, uh, and um, they were all homeowners over 65, and their income was less than um, $100,000. That was the group we chose to mail to. We took out anybody that was currently on the program, and uh, don't think we had a tremendous response to that, um, not as much as we expected. We saw 116 people that were deceased or sold come off the program, and we removed 58 people that uh, just failed to come in and refile. We believe that's due to um, the governor's executive order that was in place two years ago when these people would have last applied. They did not need to come into the office, so they were just automatically renewed as is. And. I, we think that now that the people had to come in, that these people that maybe wouldn't have qualified or wouldn't have shown up two years ago now have come off. So we think that's just a spike because of the executive order from two years ago, and it should kind of level out in the coming years. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, any questions for Ross, Representative Georgiatis? Hi, Ross. Drew Georgiatis, District 9. Um, you said you mailed to uh, 1,000 new people and they were all homeowners. Could you just, I, I probably should know this, um, renters don't qualify? I know it's property tax, but isn't property tax built into your rent? And so could you explain to me how that works? Well, this program is the, it's called the homeowners program. So this is just for homeowners. Um, there's a separate program that's um, through that's reimbursed by the state for renters, which we're taking uh, applications for right now. So that's a, they they have their own separate program. That's great to hear. Do we ever get? Um, we don't have to vote on that, so we don't get. Um, do we get? I don't remember hearing about that in the past. Right. So we have. You know, the the program I'm talking about tonight is the town program. There is a st state homeowners program that. Um, people also qualify for it has a much lower threshold of income so we take those apps simultaneously so that state homeowners program is comparable to the renters program but the renters program is paid by the state we take the app and the checks come directly from the state okay so you take the but you don't implement it so okay thank right. you very much 
That's good. I'm pressing my computer. Uh, Representative Sesma. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Liz Esma, District 4. Hi, Ross, and thank you for your presentation. Are we working on um, the ability for applicants to apply online? And second part to that is even if we had that capability, do they still need to come in and present anything in your office? Um, they really still need to come in. You know, the amount of material we have to review, and we really don't have a safe way for them to transmit their entire tax return to us. Um, so it, it's, it actually would save time for everyone if that they do come in, because we can go through that tax return, get the questions answered. We take, we take a lot of material when we, um, for the program. And thank you. My, my other question is, if someone, uh, say, sold stock during the, the prior year, so that appears capital gains, you know, on their tax return. That's calculated as income, or is that seen as an exception and not formulated into the total income? I believe capital gains are counted because it's, it's income. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Zesma. Representative Parham. Cindy Parham, District 2. Hey, Ross. Um, I had a question about um, going off of Liz's question. I remembered that uh, we were thinking in our committee meetings about um, some type of appeals process for somebody that has a one-time withdrawal from a retirement or a stock sale because of maybe a medical condition or a family emergency that created them to not qualify for senior tax relief for that year but had always been able to receive the benefit of a credit in the past. Have you seen that in any neighboring towns work out or have, um, do you have any ideas of who might, uh, who you think would be part of like an appeals committee where some resident could say, I know I don't qualify this year because I did a withdrawal from a taxable account and now I'm gonna have to count that as my income. Is there any kind of a one-time appeals program that you heard of in the past? I have, I'm not aware of any towns having an appeal. I mean, the, 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 the guidelines are laid out so that, you know, mm -hmm. you'd really be making exceptions to your own ordinance. Mm -hmm. But I'm not aware of any other towns that, that have an, uh, an appeal for like an income-based okay. issue. And then the other question I have is, as you know, as part of our committee meetings when we meet, you um, always have good input. And we have looked at like a 16 town done a study and you've seen the results where we're the only town out of many towns in Connecticut that have the deferral not be able to apply for it till age 75. Whereas most towns either don't have the program or the age is 65. Um, I feel like we're like the only one in our our area after doing the study. Um, do you feel like that would really help the numbers because we've lost 47 applicants this year? That to how, how do you think that might affect the numbers if we allow deferral at a 10 years younger age? I don't think you'd see a lot of people jump on the deferral. The, the credit program is, is quite generous mm -hmm. and that's why you see so many on that and that's why you see no one taking the freeze. Mm -hmm. Because by the time the freeze program would would even come close to equaling the credit, you'd have to come off, which because you can only stay on it for six years. So in this economy, you don't think the deferral program would be popular between sixty five and seventy five, just because people are trying to save like some cash flow, you know. So I I, I just don't see I, any town I've been in that's had a deferral. You've, we've never seen a large number of people move to that program or draw them in. People like the credit, mm -hmm. they don't want to have that mm -hmm. liability and that it has to be paid back and you know at some point down the road they want to just take their credit and mm -hmm. be done. So it's not a marketing thing, you don't think? You don't think it's that residents all know about this and think there's only credit? Because I think in my opinion, I feel like our residents know about the credit and don't really know that deferral is an option. But we'll take it to another Time. I mean, the information's out there. You know, we publicize all three programs, but again, it's just not, it, the credit is generous, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, people select that. Okay, thanks. Representative Gail. Thank you. Hi, Hannah Gail, District 6. I'm also on the committee. Um, 
I just want to make sure, and I'm sure you did, I'm just double checking that all of those 1100 or 1137 participants received emails warning them that they did have to reapply this year and you know, noting that they did not have to two years ago. No, we don't email them. We, we send them a letter in February um, notifying anybody that has to renew that they're due in, and then we send them a reminder in mid-April, uh, mid to late April, they get a reminder letter. So they're, they're notified at least twice. Thank you so much. And I just do have one more question about the deferral sure. program because that keeps coming up in our conversation. Because I've seen in other places where it is used more and um, it just strikes me that, um, do you have an objection to lowering the age for that? Would you have a problem with that? No. Right. No. So Again, I think you know if you compare Fairfield's credit program to other yeah, towns. I know it's very, it's generous. very generous. So yeah, that's right. really what's going to, you know, right. make the decision for most people. Sure. No, I, I understand that. I'm just thinking in terms of just um, having just extra tools on hand in case there's more economic, you know, upheaval and, and that, that might, and since it's a, a win situation for the town because we eventually do recoup that, it's not such a bad idea to have, you know, people on that program. Right. Preferably. I always felt the deferral was the best if you needed, um, you know, to help your cash flow. Yeah. You know, that the homeowner needed cash flow. That's the that's the biggest bang you could get. Right. But again, you know, you, we see a lot of people hitting the max. Right. On our credit program, whereas you right. won't see that in other towns quite as much. Right. But you would be supportive if we if we made that change and publicized I have no problem. it. Okay. Thank you very much. Representative Vergara. Thank you, Jill Vergara for District 7. Thanks so much for coming to speak to us, Ross. Um, I, I wanted to check and make sure that you're going to be speaking to the Board of Finance as well and, and presenting this information because we are no longer the sole body to review this and we've been having problems coordinating with the Board of Finance to open review up. And um, I think it would be helpful for them to hear these, this data because there's been serious attrition from this program. Um, I haven't been asked, but I can certainly pass this along to them. If they want me to go to the meeting, I certainly will. I, I think that would be great because there really has been significant attrition from the program. You can't see it in some of the um, data that, that uh, Mr. Murray Presented, uh, presented to us, but even just in FY 2022, the participation was um, 1,315 participants. I think you, you forgot to just include it in your um, chart that was the um, historical chart. It's missing that number. It should be there. I had all three pages. Oh, yeah, I think that, I think you accidentally put it as zero. On the, oh, okay. Yeah, um, so that, I, I think that that just needs to be updated and then um, I want you know I wanted to say that in FY 2011 we had um, 1623 people on the program so and historically if you go back um, a couple decades that was generally what the participation level was and it was only until very recently that it really started dropping significantly. So um, even if you go back to the stats from when it started in 1982, um, the participation was um, 1,326. So it's very concerning that we have so few people, so few seniors on the program right now. Um, I had a couple of other comments. Um, in reference, in, in, in response to Representative Parham's question about the appeals process, in reviewing other towns, I have noticed that there does seem to be some kind of um, uh, appeal or review process in many, in many towns where it either goes to the Board of Appeals or the Board of Selectmen, um, because a lot of times there can be a discrepancy over an interpretation of a definition. And I think that that happened in our town with the, um, how it was being applied to people with disabilities. And um, we corrected the language ultimately after that happened, but 
I do think that it's worthwhile to provide a process to people so that they could go to someone and say, look, this, it says this in our ordinance, but I don't think it's being interpreted fairly or evenly or equitably. So um, the other way to do it is also providing a hardship exception so that people can just say, this one thing happened to me. It was um, so unusual. We had to spend so much money because of the hurricane. And um, because of that, we got money. And it was included in our income and shouldn't be this year. And I think it would be a good thing to do that as a town. And I also wanted to say that I think it's a good, great thing that three extensions were granted this year. Last year, there was someone that I was communicating with, and she was really upset. There were a whole bunch of very complicated circumstances, but um, she hadn't been granted an extension, and I think it's, it's a very nice thing to do. And she, um, especially with people who are very reliant on this money and, and possibly could have to leave the town if they don't receive um, this credit. So I think it's good to give people the opportunity to have these extensions. Thank you, Jill. Any other questions or comments for Ross? Thank you, Ross. Um, let's see, Mr. Warren, I, are you here today, tonight? I don't believe so. So number three, Harbor Management Committee, George Harris, I think I saw you on there. George, you're here. Okay. Come on up. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to do this. Hello. I'm a longtime resident of Fairfield. I've been here 35 plus years. I've got three children who have gone through the Fairfield Public Schools and doing very well. Um, I've been a boat owner since I was 16 years old. Um, I'm very close to the water. Uh, I just wanted to give back a little. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Representative McCormick. Good evening, Mr. Harris. Karen McCormick, District 2. Is your wife Teresa? Yes. I went to high school with Teresa. Tell her I said hi. Those are the tough questions. <laughs> Anybody else? Representative Georgiatis. Hi, George. I didn't recognize you when you first came in, but it's good to see you again. So tell, tell your family to say hi. Thank you. I will. Anybody else? Buddies with George? Wanna say hello. <laughs> Hi to his wife at home. Thank you, George. Thanks for volunteering. Doesn't look like you have to come back next week. All right, we the Ethics Commission appointments will be on our January calendar. Uh, there needs to be 10 days uh, due to charter between approval of BOS and coming to us. August. Did I say January? Wow. <laughs> Rushing this year by. Can't wait to be out of here. All right, Fair TV. Uh, I see Lee Camlet is online. Yes. Mr. Camlet, you want to turn on your microphone and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to do this? I think you're still muted. Nope. Hang on a second. There, you, there are. you are. Welcome. So 
I come to you uh, uh, with 33 years of experience as a network news producer at ABC News and NBC News. And after that career, I was six years as Dean of the School of Communication at Quinnipiac University. So I think I have some expertise or some uh, experience that I think might be helpful to the Fair TV Commission. Uh, and I think everybody needs to um, uh, do something to help the community, and this seems to be up my alley. Excellent. Any questions? Anybody friends with his wife? Any other <laughs> representative? Wilk? Uh, Jay Wilk, uh, District 5. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so, uh, Lee, uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you for volunteering. Um, I've been, and I guess everybody here knows, I've been an advocate for Fair TV for a long time. And one of the things I want to say is, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you were, the NBC, you were with NBC and, 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 and network TV, but public TV is completely different. So I think you're aware of that, right? I think you're on mute again. Did you hear the question? You're of still. I understand the difference there between you go. TV and public public access TV and network television. They're entirely different. Right. Okay. So we agree on that. All right. Thanks. So um, thanks for volunteering. <laughs> Just want to make sure we know that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for volunteering. Uh, don't think you have to be back next week. Thank you. Mr. Foley, not here. All right, Mr. Barnhart, NAA program. Good evening. Uh, Mark Barnhart, Director of CUNY Economic Development. Uh, I come before you uh, with regard to our annual participation in the Neighborhood Assistance Act program. As uh, most of you or probably all of you know at this point, this is a state uh, program that allows businesses to claim a corporate tax credit for any cash contributions made to qualifying municipal agencies or community programs uh, conducted by tax exempt or nonprofit uh, groups. Um, our participation in the program is limited to um, soliciting applications from interested nonprofits and municipal agencies under the program, designated a liaison, which traditionally has been uh, my office, and conducting a public hearing and then um, vetting those applications and approving it here locally through the legislative body before it goes to the Department of Revenue Services. Uh, so we have to have a, a public hearing, which we did on June 1st. Uh, we received six applications by the deadline from five different organizations, many of whom are uh, repeat offenders. They've applied in the past, so they're very familiar with the program. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you have at this time. Any questions for Mr. Barnhart? Representative Gell, thank you. Hi, Mr. Bernhardt, Anna Gale again. Um, I just, I'm gonna bring up the idea of a list of nonprofits again. You know, and I, I yeah. Um, so we um, send out this notice to every nonprofit that we can identify, uh, including those that uh, obviously have expressed interest or applied for the program in the past. Um, so it's pretty well advertised, and then we put a notice in the paper just to make sure that we cover our bases. So um, I think we've got pretty wide distribution. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't work for everyone because it's not guaranteed funds here. It, you really have to match with a, a, a corporation that's looking to, uh, to make a contribution for which then they can apply for a tax credit. Um, so it, doesn't necessarily guarantee money, but it's a fairly simple application to, to fill out. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gale. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none and seeing none on WebEx, let's go to CDBG. 
There's not a bar in New York City? No, I'll see. <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Um, so this is uh, the Community Development Block Grant Program, uh, which we've, uh, the town has been a participant in since, uh, I believe, its inception. This is program year 49. Uh, it's federal dollars that uh, originate with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, the primary objective of the program is to provide uh, decent housing, a suitable living environment, expanded economic opportunities, primarily for persons or areas of low to moderate income. Uh, we are an entitlement community, meaning by virtue of our size and population, we receive an annual allocation each year from the federal government under this program. We have some discretion as to how we um, allocate those funds, but it has to be in accordance with our uh, five-year consolidated plan and our annual plan and has to meet a national objective, um, as well as be eligible to receive federal dollars. So again, we solicit applications each year from, from uh, organizations. Uh, we can allocate up to 15% of our grant dollars uh, towards uh, pu so-called public service activities, where there, that's the, the one that's most competitive, 20% uh, to cover our program administration costs and the rest uh, distributed between affordable housing activities and other community development needs that we've identified. So um, I've included in your packet um, the proposed uh, annual allocation plan. It's largely consistent with uh, last year's plan that, that was presented. We are receiving uh, fewer dollars from the federal government uh, for the upcoming year, which begins October 1st, about a 3.7% 3, uh, 3 reduction from the current year little less than $500,000, which we've attempted to offset somewhat with program income, which we anticipate receiving by the end of the uh, program year uh, to offset that, uh, that reduction. So I'm happy, again, to take any questions that you have at this time. Any questions on this program? You were staring at me, and then I turned my head and you raised your hand. Um, Representative Pastilli. Mr. Moderator, <laughs> it's not a question. Um, uh, Representative Havey just let me know that the sound for the speaker, the people who are presenting, is not going well. So I was just wondering if you could just get closer to the mic. Sorry about that. I'll try. <laughs> Thank don't you. I, don't ask me to repeat all that. <laughs> You're good. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, uh, number eight, South Central Regional Water Authority. Mr. Cattell, you're here. You on your own? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm sure you'll do fine. Good evening. Thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to present this uh, to the to you. Um, this is a Household Hazardous Waste Central Agreement. This is a program that the town has been in for probably 30 plus years going, um, that they've been going through. This allows people to get rid of their household hazardous waste. Um, normally, it's a three-year contract. I uh, revised it so that it was a one-year contract with two one-year options because the Metro Cog was talking about trying to do a program also and I want to keep our options open to get the best price for you. Um, with that, I'll entertain any questions you have. Any questions, Representative Pastilli? Uh, Sharon Pastilli, District 3. Um, is, is the yearly hazardous waste collection day still in August, like end of August? Yes, it is. It's the uh, August 26. Uh, well, it's generally been always the last week in August. And um, is there any thought to m moving it so that participation would be better because people aren't on vacation, or do, what's wh what's how's our partition participation rate tracking with that? Um, it was high for uh, which you would kind of understand back in. 2020 and 21, when COVID hit, everybody was home, and guess what? I think they cleaned out their garages, their basements, and everything else. Uh, so we had a, a high amount then, and then it turned around, and, and last year started coming down. 
All right, and then are there any material changes in um, what will be accepted? And is that, um, you know, something that we expect to change and would that affect our decision on whether or not we would, like, if <clears throat> MetroCog were come to come forward with something different, what would we expect the differences to be? Would it be a difference in what they'd accept or do you have any knowledge of what that might be? It's probably usually the same uh, collector company, that vendor that they use, Clean Harbors. So it would, it would probably be the same. Um, they're the key uh, vendor in this northeast area. So I would not expect changes as what you could bring. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pastilli. Any other questions? The motion on the agenda item um, needs to be amended next week. Uh, it's item number 11. It should end at the word center because the rest of that's already in the resolution. Correct, Mr. Cato? It's in the resolution and the resolution that was provided that talks about the couple of paragraphs as to how it's uh, broken up and mentions uh, it needs to be changed to cap it. The Board of Selectmen want to cap it at what I had budgeted, which was 63107 If it exceeds that amount, then I am to go back to the Board of Selectmen to advise them. So it's in your full page item. All right. Thank you. Nothing. Okay. All right. Uh, let's hit the, the big one, vehicles. Number nine. This is our capital equipment budget. It's a three-year plan. Uh, we finished our first three-year plan uh, when the director came in. The original one from um, 21 to through 23, that was a $3.9 million budget. Uh, we pur purchased all those equipment, and we are got a lot better ability to fight any uh, snowstorms. This continues with another three-year program in the amount of two million three hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars, and it consists of approximately uh, eleven vehicles or pieces of equipment. And with that, I will entertain any questions that you would like. Representative Bateson. Thank you, Ed Bateson, District 1. Okay, so this appropriate, this amount is for a, for three years' worth of vehicles. That is correct. It's broken down to 1053000 in FY24, $702,000 FY25, and 622000 in FY26. Can you say that again, please? 1,053,000 FY24, 702,000 FY25, 622,000 in FY26. Okay, has this gone before the Board of Finance yet? Yes, it has. Okay. Um, I remember participating in the capital planning workshop. I just, I don't remember these numbers. Is this going to be similar to what I saw in the capital planning documents for those next, for FY 24, 25, and 26? I believe so. Um, maybe if Jared's on board, he can weigh in here. Yeah, hi, hey, Mr. Bateson, Jared. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh... It, it's very similar to what was in the capital plan. Uh, that I think the third year is a, a bit lower. It's about half of what we had in the capital plan. Why is it uh, half? Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the equipment the, the amount that we had in there was um, based on a on a previous estimate from DPW, and uh, I think they went back and looked at the looked at what their needs were, and so it's a little, it's less now. Okay, I remember a couple of years ago, we had actually had like a, a, a master document of inventory and like similar to what the fire department did about what you're planning on replacing and when. Is that document been updated or is it still out there? Uh, I think what was attached in your information shows what 
has been is being replaced with the new purchase of this equipment. There's only one new additional piece that's not replacing something else. That's a mini excavator. You mean like a little bobcat thing? Uh, a little larger than a bobcat. Probably about fourteen thousand pound uh, mini excavator. Okay, so I guess what I'm getting at is there some sort of plan you're following? Yes, we're replacing items as they get old so that we maintain the same type of equipment um, and then keep it operational. Okay, that'll do for now. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bateson. Any other questions? Just Is there any issue with getting these vehicles as far as are we going to have to wait, or are these? Unfortunately, it's, you know, year, about four or five years ago, we used to get pieces of equipment in six to seven months. We've had a truck uh, from that last group that took almost 18 months. Um, some items are become available a little quicker. Uh, if that's the case, I think we, we did that last at the last plan. We switched one that we moved up a year, and and one that we weren't getting right away moved it back a year. So and that gives us the flexibility to do that to make sure that we get it online with equipment that's available. Do we put a down payment for this equipment, or pay for it up front? How does that work? Generally, we issue a purchase order to hold it and gets it going. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant evening. You too. Uh, FEMA grant. Amiga. Hear me, right? Okay. Uh, a little closer. Pull the mic closer to you. Is it good? Much okay. better. So I'm from engineering department. Uh, I'm a senior engineer. I'm under Bill Hurley. Today he's not here, so I will be presenting you the FEMA reimbursement. So, um, so technically I'll go with the little bit of background, we received FEMA a reimbursement for amount of 256,335, 95 cents, um, dollars and 95 cents. Um, this happened because, uh, because of the Hurricane Ida that deposited almost four to six inches of rain in a span of few years resulting in stream and pipe overflows causing damage to the town's infrastructure. After a year and a half review with FEMA regarding documentation of damage, eligibility and approved cost estimates, FEMA has granted formal acceptance of these repairs. Uh, FEMA has issued four project worksheets awards that total uh, $256,335.95. And these four uh, colors uh, that we have received the reimbursements uh, for are uh, Werner Hill Culvert Replacement, uh, Horse Tavern Brook Retaining Wall Repairs, Twin Brook Lane Slope Stabilization and Material Removal, and a group of four bridge and culverts. And those four groups are Marvin Lane, Governor's Lane, Hillside Road, and Greenfield Hill Road Bridge Culvert. And these all need repairs, and there is a scour repair. For Twin Brook, uh, we will have to go for full permits with the Conservation Department. We have received Conservation Department permit. Another hearing is in August. Others are just the slope stabilization, and uh, not much permits are required for those. Um, uh, for these reimbursements, uh, I will also go over the financing for them. This project will be funded by FEMA and DPW operating budget accounts. If the cost exceed grants amount, the town has option to solicit additional funding with documentation use of lump sum or add alternate pay items will be implemented. So this is a, just a little brief uh, history and background, but if you have any questions, just let me know. Any questions? 
Yes. Representative Gerber. Um, hi, Bill Gerber. Hi. How, are how are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> Thank, thanks for taking my question. Yes. Um, are these the reimbursements that were identified by the internal auditor during that internal audit that was done? Uh, you mean by the town auditor, internal auditor? Um, what happened? I'll just go over a little bit of procedure. What happened was, when the Hurricane Ida impacted these four culverts along with Twin Brook, uh, DPW gave us a list that were heavily damaged with scour and slope stabilization erosions. Uh, so we had a list, and we had to go to FEMA first. So there were FEMA auditors that visited the town. There were four, five, four to five inspectors that visited the town first. So that was the first step. And then we went to each location with the inspectors. They inspected and uh, uh, observed what exactly what the damages were. And they made the list, and they, measure, they did the measurements and they documented each and every location from the FEMA. And the internal auditor was involved uh, with the inspectors just to, for the verification of the measurements and how much has the cost estimated. So this is what the involvement of the internal auditor was from the town. I, 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 it, I may have misunderstood, but it kind of seemed like when she was going through this that that she identified something that had sort of been been lost or you know but maybe i'm wrong like that people had sort of forgotten about and so she pushed to get it done um and i was just sort of wondering is is there like a master list of all amounts that were that are due to the town so and then so that we know sort of if there's anything outstanding or i, I may have misinterpreted her her explanation of it but uh, internal auditor, uh, you mean uh, Connie is internal yeah, auditor? Yeah, Con Connie presented to the Board of uh, Finance and said, you know, she was quite happy that she had found this. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. she was involved in, um, in updating, uh, uh, she was just involved in auditing, uh, basically the FEMA more was uh, had a direct contact with the engineering department because they wanted uh, uh, full uh, specific measurements of each and every location. So the measurements, we had to submit the measurements, we had to submit all the cost estimates of each of the locations at how, uh, you know, the, the estimate that will be involved in repairing these. Uh, so engineering was involved and obviously Connie was involved in between in expediting and coordinating with FEMA. So, so there's just outstanding work that needed to be completed in order to get the... the uh, yes, this is, these are the locations which were impacted by Hurricane Ida. So that's why these are on the priority list because they are FEMA reimbursable. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, Representative Gill. Hi, Hannah Gill, District 6. Hi. Hi. I just want to make sure there's no issues with the deadline because there is, there, you know, there's a, yeah. Uh, no, there are no issues with the deadlines. They fall in the, into the category from C to D, which are permanent repair category, and we have taken extension from the FEMA for 18 months. So we will be, start, we will be putting out for bidding in July, and we are hoping to start the work in August. Uh, we have a deadline till October, um, I think in July 2024, we have a deadline till then and before we hope to finish everything by, uh, by September. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Miga. Thank you. Appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, item number 11, 148,000 coronavirus recovery fund. Uh, Chief Calamaris, Jared, you're on the line. Is Mr. Geely here as well? Or are you going to handle that, Jared? Yeah, I, I can give the overview of this. Uh, we had a, cu a couple of uh, projects that came up that we thought would be appropriate for um, for use of the ARPA funding uh, came up during the last meeting that I think people were 
uh, some of the members of the Board of Finance were a little thrown by the, the very long title, the Coronavirus State Fiscal Recovery Fund and the Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Fund. I think for obvious reasons, we refer to it as ARPA. Um, so we don't have to say that every time. And so uh, this is ARPA money. Um, there is there is still uh, approximately uh, 1.5 million dollars and um, that we have unallocated, um, and this will use some of that money. 148 thousand between two projects, one from the uh, history museum and one from the police. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions about ARPA funding generally. If you have any, um, otherwise I'll pass it over to uh, Mike Jaley and the Chief Calamaris to talk about the individual projects. Well, I, I don't think anybody's prepared to look at all the other uh, projects that were funded. Um, maybe we could do that at another meeting though. Was, uh, you know, I don't think we're prepared for that. We're just prepared for what's in front of us tonight. So Representative uh, Stilly. Thanks, oh, Sharon Pastilli, District Three. Is, is I can't remember. Is there a master list that you'll provide us that'll show us like the percentage complete? Because if we don't, for whatever we don't complete, we have to we don't receive the funding, right? So are we tracking all the projects on a master list? And could you share that with us as a point of information? Yeah, I'm happy to share it with the I, I, I uh, share it with the Board of Finance uh, every quarter. Um, and, you know, it's not really based on a percentage, but you get a sense of, um, you know, where each project stands, what, um, uh, and what the update is on, on each of the projects, what's left to be done, what the next steps are. And so, um, we're, we're obviously watching that. We know that there's about a year and a half left before all the money needs to be committed, not spent, but committed. So we still have some time. Um, and I've spoken with any of the, any of the department heads who have, uh, our grants and they're all uh, confident at this point that, uh, they'll be able to get that commitment done within the next 18 months. But, you know, we'll, we, we continue to look at it on, uh, a very regular basis. And so if anything changes on that end, then we'll, uh, you know, we'll have to reassess at that point, whatever base, depending on what, which project it is, if it looks like it's going to be over that time limit. But right now we don't have any concerns with that. And then, and then they had extra, extra projects fund. that we could add if something isn't going to get done in time, right? We have other short fuse things we can add at the end if we need to. I think, um, are you, so there's unallocated funds. If, is that what you're asking? Yeah, do yeah, we have a way to allocate them either. if we find out near the end that we're that we, we wouldn't use them for a longer term project? Right. So, so um, you know, similar to what we're doing now and what we uh, did a few months ago with some other projects, as as they come up, um, you know, if so, if something were to be unallocated, then we would go through the same the same process of going to the uh, each of the three bodies for approval. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jared. So I think we'll schedule you for August to give us an update on all the projects, please. To see where see we stand, it. okay? It's a long list. Um, let's let the chief talk about his project here. Sure, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, we are uh, proposing a safe corridors to school project, which augments our surveillance, our current surveillance uh, of 12 cameras to 30 cameras. So we're increasing it by 18. Uh, two of the primary objectives whenever we look at school safety, we look at early detection and early warning systems and um, uh, SEPTED, which is, um, I'm sorry crime prevention through environmental design, and that basically is how you design certain things to provide security. Uh, this would provide security through a, um, obviously the first one, early detection, and what this system does is it is adapted with artificial intelligence, which provides early detection in the event that we would have 
um, some sort of um, infiltration or something to the schools where um, officers would get notifications on their cell phones um, to that detection. Um, I can just touch on a couple of the questions that came up on uh, some of the previous some of the previous meetings. Um, so this, uh, someone asked me what the artificial intelligence, like what exactly would it do? Would it do? And um, I had some basis of knowledge. This, is, this whole system is connected through the Bridgeport, Bridgeport uh, Fusion Center. In fact, the idea has been implemented several years ago through the Bridgeport Police Department and was very effective. Um, we kind of, I guess I'll say, dipped our foot in the pool, dipped our toe in the pool for a little bit just to get a couple of cameras and see how those would uh, implement them and see how they would, how effective they would be in the town of Fairfield and they have been extremely effective to the extent that we want to uh, augment our system. Um, so this, the, some of the search capabilities can locate vehicles with um, absolutely no plate information. Um, they can use artificial intelligence that supports event-based data of bicycles, people's, uh, people, ATVs, UTVs, et cetera. Um, it generates alerts to officers in less than 10 seconds. Um, and it has some pretty significant uh, capabilities to where it can uh, capture unique characteristics of certain vehicles, for example, uh, convertibles or uh, pickup trucks, and those search capabilities allow us to, uh, I guess, hone down the search so that when we're looking for something in particular, it gives us the ability to, uh, or less, less returns, I guess what you would call a filter on any other search method. Um, so it allows us to filter the search, for example, if we were looking for a convertible or a pickup truck to, to uh, give us that capability. Um, some other questions were related to um, privacy, privacy rights, and um, the cameras that um, we're using are currently being used by the state for traffic management, and they are used uh, on every intersection that most of you go through every day, post in North Benton, just look up at the lights, you'll see the cameras there. Um, Stratfield Center will soon have uh, cameras there when they implement the, the new uh, intersection um, and many others all the, all the biggies in town that have state um, that have state traffic lights will have those uh, cameras on them uh, with that um, open up for questions sure thank you okay. any questions for chief Calamaris representative Georgiatis hi chief Drew Georgiatis district 9 um, I have a couple of questions. So the $148,000 is to purchase the 18 additional cameras? 108,000 is. 108,000. A backup says 148. That's for the other item. Oh, the other item. 40 is for the other item. OK, thank you. If um, I could just add, it's 107,406 is what my request was. OK, thank you. Um, do you have any information for us for ongoing costs to maintain these? Does it cost um, annually have a certain cost to maintain the cameras? And then I have a follow-up question. It's going to be about $6,000 a year. Okay, thank you. Um, in the previous information we got, um, it's the safe schools, corridor schools area. Is that so that it fits into the ARPA um, qualification, does it need to be near schools in order for you to qualify to use ARPA Monday for these cameras? That's a good question. Um, I, I was not planning on, I was going to put this uh, through a different uh, project and it was suggested that we do it through ARPA. Um, it does not meet, it does not need to have the requirements uh, involved with school. I actually modeled the product, project after what Bridgeport did in consultation with the uh, individual who runs their fusion center. Um, and I thought it was a great idea and um, it, it works cohesive with the current system that we have that is also attached to the fusion center. 
Um, so I thought it was a it was a good idea and would increase the safety and security of our town. Yeah, no, I agree with that. But you're using ARPA funds for this. We are, but it's not a requirement for the ARPA funds. Okay, so it qualifies on any street in any town. You're just putting them near schools. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Representative Spillier. Hi, Representative Spillier, District 4. Um, I was just curious, and this may not be relevant, but I believe in the state legislature lately they passed um, something or they were talking about passing um, speed cameras, like monitoring so you can be ticketed. Um, are these, do these serve as like dual purpose cameras where we can use them for that as well in the future? They do not. So you would have to have like multiple cameras set up at a certain area if, if we decide to go along with um, what they did at the state level? Yes, um, it's, it's a completely different system. Yeah, this is specifically for uh, surveillance. Okay, thank you. She's just concerned about the one at the four corners when it goes in. Um, uh, anybody else? Uh, Representative Zesma. Thank you, Liz Esma, District 4. Hey, Chief. I, you partially answered my question. What other communities um, have installed similar systems, specifically near schools, et cetera? Bridgeport is one, obviously. Bridgeport, Stanford, Norwalk, um, I believe Westport. So there are several. OK, so the same type of system with the same um, design specifically for those locations? That's correct. OK, thank you. Thank you. Representative Wolk. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Jay Wolk, District 5, and it's always good to see you, Chief. Um, my question is, so adding these cameras to do more protection to our schools, which I'm definitely for, um, my question is, so right now you said you had 18 cameras and we're going to add to go to 30 cameras. Do some of the schools have cameras and you're just adding to schools that don't have all the schools have cameras right now. That's what my question is. So um, we are we have we currently have twelve. We're adding eighteen to get to thirty. That's that was your first question. Your second question was: Do all the schools have cameras? They have cameras within the schools and around the schools. Um, these cameras would provide an early detection method for certain incidents, and they are, I'll say, off-site but close enough to the schools where we have. Uh, early, early warning. It's great. I'm for this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Volk. Representative Gill. Good evening, Chief. Always nice to see you. Hannah Gale, District 6. So I'm, you know, this is the first time I'm seeing this, and so I, I apologize if I'm slightly reactive. But, um, you know, none of the school situations that I've seen would this have mattered for the safety of the children because. It, was, it would have been impossible to detect, you know, given on a corridor. It, this seems like it would be helpful for catching someone once they've committed a crime. And I just um, concerned that this doesn't really nothing to harden our schools. All it does is increase surveillance, which, you know, I'm, I mean, I live in Fairfield. I want to be protected. I understand that the, the, the these entrance points from these other towns are you know, where you need to have, you know, eyes open, but I, I would far prefer to see direct hardening of the schools than something like this. I honestly feel like this is a euphemism, like it's being called school related, but it's not at all. So I, I apologize, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just challenging you off the cuff, I apologize. Um, so I'll answer, I'll answer that in a couple of different ways. So I think every approach when uh, we look at school target hardening is what we refer to it as, is uh, a multifaceted approach. There's no magic button for a, a school incident. And I think you're referring to a mass shooting or a violent encounter 
uh, but most of the times our incidents refer to uh, domestic incidents where um, family members may be a custody dispute and uh, we know who the violent party is, we know who is should, who should and should not be next to that victim and we can provide our system with some information that would alert us if that person was near the school or not. Um, I could go into some, some examples, um, but it's probably better that I, I don't. Um, I, I'll touch on your other comment about uh, seems more like surveillance. Um, it, does, it does help in solving other crimes as well. I used an example where we had a, um, just out in front of this building here, we had a fatal motor, motorcycle accident and our current cameras that we have there now were able to um, not only identify the suspect vehicle, but we had him in custody in less than an hour. Um, that was a fatal hit and run motorcycle accident that that individual likely would not have got, gotten caught. Um, so um, I understand your concerns, but I think the benefits far outweigh uh, the, the concerns. Okay, so I have one more question. Like, where is this line? Because you're, we we're talking about adding, you know, all of these cameras, as you said, on top of the state cameras. They want to put ticket cameras in. I mean, before we know it, we're going to be living in a prison. I mean, I, so I, you know, I, these seem reasonable on some level, you know, because there are only this, this amount and they are on these direct corridor places. But, you know, I really feel like there has to be some sort of, we don't want to be that, you know, the frog in the pot where it just keeps piling on top, of, you know, until we, you know, we, we really f have our, our life curtailed in terms of, I don't know, and, you know, just, just constantly being watched. So I don't know where the line is, but. If I knew, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> Representative Gerber. Hi, Chief. Bill Gerber, District 2. Thanks for taking my question. Um, you know, the 355000 that the Board of Ed got from uh, COVID relief, is this sort of being used for the same project, the same sort of? The it is not. Um, they're, use, they're using their, we, we uh, both uh, Superintendent Testani and I have consulted on on this uh, before uh, he was awarded that. And then uh, we, we are constantly in dialogue with school security and school safety. And, um, you know, I have six members of my department and a sergeant that are assigned to the schools that work in coordination with his staff to, um, to uh, implement these strategies. Um, his, Cameras are designed more for internal, not only upgrading, um, and I don't want to speak for him, but I just know in our conversations, upgrading the current systems that some are antiquated and also implementing new camera systems where um, there are some uh, gaps in security. Do the, the, um, so you're not sort of responsible for his, uh, for the Board of Ed security camera system? They, you know. That's correct. We are not. Yeah, we we have access to new. them. I, yeah. I I thought I thought that they consult you and that it falls on your plate. So yeah. No, we have access. Um, yeah. There's consultation. There's constant dialogue going back and forth. But that that falls under their budget. Okay. And and this would fall. But implementation as well and sort of so you consult on on, on that or they we yeah. do. Okay. Thank you. Representative Brown on WebEx. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Chief, I apologize if I missed this in your remarks, but is this system strictly doing license plate scans and motor vehicle lookups, or is it doing facial recognition as well? Um, it's, it's doing uh, all of the above, not facial recognition. If there is certain uh, characteristics or identifiers that we can put in the search filters, it, it could help us to narrow a search parameter, if that makes any sense. 
Mm -hmm. So that, so let's say you're a pedestrian walking by one of these cameras, it could pick up those characteristics and that filter. Yeah, so yes. for example, if I said that I'm looking for a Hispanic male with a red sweatshirt and a blue backpack, it would be able to identify um, those colors in the person's clothing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the backpack. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That means Dora couldn't get away. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, good evening, Chief. Um, just a question as a sort of, as I'm sitting here thinking about how these cameras probably are not going to do much to harden security for those types of events that we're probably most afraid of, right, um, coming to Fairfield. So the question that I have is not directly related to this particular item, but specifically, is the town either advocating or looking into ways to create real security measures within our schools to include, for example, funding of officers to be there present as a physical presence. I mean, it's one thing to talk about how we're gonna have cameras to try to catch people after the fact or maybe avoid a custody dispute or, that, or help uh, decide a custody dispute, but specifically with respect to school security, is the police department and the town, for that matter, on the law enforcement side doing anything to investigate ways to really harden security within the schools? I'm not asking for specifics as to what you're looking into, but are you at least uh, delving into uh, looking for funding or perhaps speaking to um, our federal you know, legislative uh, representatives and senators, that kind of thing? So we work every year to implement a security strategy with the Board of Education. Uh, last year we met with the board, uh, myself and Captain Ed Wya, who has uh, far more knowledge than any of us in school security and, and building security. Um, and um, we gave our recommendations to the board um, along with a security plan that they can or cannot implement certain elements of that, you know, those mitigation strategies. Um, as I said just a few minutes ago, there's no magic tool, there's no magic button. Are there some uh, costly measures that you can take? Uh, yes, there are. Um, are there also, um, you know, I think there's also a, a balance that we need to find. Um, I think we strike a, a pretty good balance in Fairfield We've had uh, some incidents that were alarming um, that we navigate through. We early detection is really a, a, a really good strategy, but there's also the the um, the NTAC approach, which um, we had a uh, National Threat Assessment Center did a symposium last year with our educators and some of our town employees to discuss some of the those approaches, and that basically is, you know, if you have a student that, um, well, let me say like this, most of the cases where we did have a very serious, or not we, other places have had serious uh, uh, incidents, um, it was always the kid that they said, I knew that kid was gonna do something wrong, or I, I knew there was something wrong with that kid. Um, and what they found was that um, there is an approach that you can take where the coach the mentor, the mom, the dad, the guidance counselor, the teacher, someone who he maybe can connect with, he or she maybe can connect with. Um, and that's the early intervention with those people usually works the best with uh, mitigating that potential uh, incident. Um, but that's not the magic button either, right? It's, 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 it's a multifaceted approach and I think the more um, people that get involved and are looking at those things that don't belong uh, is probably is probably the, the best approach uh, because there's no and, th and then you know you have to look at balance does it does it do we go too far where there's police officers standing at the the front doors of the school at an elementary school I don't know that's up for the community to decide I think um, 
but I've, I think everyone has maybe a different opinion. I think Fairfield currently strikes a pretty fair balance. Um, maybe some would see it or like to see it a little bit stronger. Some maybe would like to see it a little bit looser. Um, it's just my thoughts on that. Thank you. Representative Gill, back for more. <laughs> Good cheese. Um, have you ever heard of one situation where um, by intervening with a social worker, they prevented a school shooting? Because I've never heard of one, but I'm not in your field, obviously. <laughs> but you have. Because I've never heard of that actually working at all. Yeah, I think most of the studies that they've done, the incidents have already occurred. Um, but I can share some literature with you that shows that uh, there is a method that is pretty effective. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. I just, um, and I, you know, I just want to push back a little bit on the idea of a police officer at the door of an elementary school being intimidating. I don't think that needs to be the case, you know, at all. So. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Okay, uh, Mr. Geely. Thank you, Chief. For now, are you hanging around for the noise ordinance? Well, we're going to finish this item first. I mean, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mike Jaley, Fairfield Museum. Uh, I'll try to be very brief. Um, 40,000 of the uh, ARPA funds that you're considering right now um, are proposed to be allocated for a capital expense to help the Fairfield Museum um, renovate and reinstall into its main exhibition gallery uh, an exhibition called Creating Community, which uh, represents the most recent scholarship on 400 plus years of Fairfield's history. Um, this gallery is the main attraction for the Fairfield Museum, uh, which itself uh, attracts close to 30,000 people to our community a year and drives significant economic uh, benefits for the community. Uh, and it is the foundational exhibit uh, for our school programming, which we provide for about 4,000 Fairfield public school and private school students. Um, this is a capital project. This exhibit will be up uh, for 10 plus years. Um, and it's uh, part of a, about a $250,000 budget uh, for the entire project. Um, that's it in short. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank Any, you. Questions? Any questions? I'm not seeing any here or any online. Thank you for coming tonight. Great. Thank you for your consideration. How long do you think you're going to be, Mr. Bodie? All right, let's go. So we'll start with the WPCA transformer, number 12. We have three transformers all the same size, all interchangeable up until just recently. The one we're looking to replace, we, we're looking to replace in February of 2022. Availability was non-existent, new, used, carcass, nothing. So we move that money to replace another transformer that once that was changed, we could use the old one as a replacement for this one. We didn't think it was gonna happen so soon, but February of this year, the transformer we were looking to replace failed, it shorted. So we put the 22-year-old one we had just replaced in its place. So we're now looking to buy a refurbished one to replace it. Uh, new is around $74,000, one-year warranty. Refurbished is about 68 with a three-year warranty. Don't know why, but that's the way it is. So we're looking to buy a refurbished transformer we can get in two months as far as a new one. It'll take almost a year. 
Okay, any questions on the transformer? Okay, let's go to the generator. WPCF has 12, excuse me, 11 generators, three permanent ones at the plant, five permanent at pump stations, and three trailer mounted. Uh, we replaced one uh, last year at a station upgrade. Within two months, it failed. Um, the part took a year to get. Rentals are not included in a warranty. The manufacturer did accept responsibility. After all said and done, with a year of a rental, it was $80,000. With the upcoming pump station refurbishments and replacements we're going to do in the next five years, we thought having a portable that we could use at any pump station to A, power the station if the, the generator failed, or when we're doing the replacements, we can put our own generator there, save on rental. I'll take questions on that one. Any questions on the generator? Representative Georgiatis. Drew Georgiatis, District 9. Is this gas powered or um, like gasoline or uh, natural gas or It'll be diesel. electric? Diesel. Diesel. Um, because there, it's portable. Right. No, I know. but um, And you can't find one that has a renewable power source? Uh, we could certainly look into it, yes. I'd appreciate you doing that. That's sure. um, probably the mode of the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jared, I think you're done. Or did you leave already? No, he's still there. Mr. Barnhart, you're still sitting here for what? Fair rent? And Chief Calamaris is sitting here for noise ordinance. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> I will right, we'll do for fair rent first. I believe Mr. Barnhart is, is He's uh, just the supporting you. supporting actor for you? Yes. Representative Wackerman? <laughs> That's right. Okay, thank, yeah, thank you. Should I go ahead, Mark? Yes, yes please. please. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the next item is the Fair Rent Commission Ordinance. We talked a lot about that last month. Um, it's required to be um, established by state law by July 1st of this year. So... Um, we are hoping that it passes next week so that we're in compliance with that. And the idea is to have a way for tenants who have um, experienced an unconscionable increase in rent to be able to have some place to go to object to it. And the commission will have some ability to um, have a hearing and, and give some relief to the tenant if it does reach that level of being unconscionably high. Um, and I asked Mr. Barnhart to be here because he's been uh, learning a lot about it and has been a huge help to us in creating the, the ordinance. So I thought if people had questions for him or for me or any other sponsors, um, we're here. I'm pressing my computer again. Thank you, Representative Wackerman. Um, are there any questions for Representative McCormick? Uh, Karen McCormick, District 2. Uh, Mr. Barnhart, um, I'm going to ask you the question because um, it's been repeatedly represented to this body that the, uh, the rules surrounding uh, what this commission will be sort of empowered to do or the rules surrounding the powers that they'll have only deals with an unconscionable increase in rent. And um, that's not what the statute says. Uh, the statute actually talks about um, rent being charged, not, not just an increase, but rent being charged. Have you taken a look at that, and do you have an opinion on that um, based upon 
the proposed ordinance. Um, for the record, Mark Barnhart, Director of Community Economic Development. The proposed ordinance largely follows the model that was developed and circulated to communities. And in many respects, again, the um, responsibilities or um, the powers of the Fair Rent Commission largely track that which is in state statute. I didn't go line through line for this for this meeting, but that's my recollection. Um, there are other provisions here in terms of rent. I mean, uh, besides the, there is re language obviously um, harsh and unconscionable is the word that is used in in the statute. Um, but that's you know obviously subjective. Uh, there are other provisions in the statute and the ordinance that talks about other issues that come up during the course of, um, you know, the tenant could complain about other issues that might be subject to investigation and an order from the Fair Rent Commission. Uh, my specific, I don't mean to cut you off, but my specific question actually has to do with uh, Section 3, subparagraph A, which says, in determining whether a rental charge or a proposed increase in a rental charge is so excessive. Mm -hmm. So again, it's been stated here this evening by Representative Wackerman and in the prior meeting by everyone who presented on this that this, this ordinance will only apply to rent increases. That's how it's been presented. And have you read section three subparagraph A and, and what is your understanding as to whether or not that will apply to more than just rental increases. I'm going to just interject that um, I can tell you that the guidance we got from, um, I think it was the, I think it was the CCM, but uh, said that the intention is to just deal with increases in rent. Um, I think, Karen, to the extent the statute's unclear, which is often the case when it's a new statute, um, it'll be something that people can address with their legislators, but um, I don't know if Mark has heard any other interpretations. I um, have not. I have done exhaustive work. I've talked to a number of communities that have fair rent commissions to understand the, how they work. Um, and, you know, the experience varies from, from community to community in terms of the activity levels. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the language here. Um, at least I think I have the current language. Um, it says, in determining whether a rental charge or proposed increase in a rental charge is so excessive with due regard to all the circumstances, be harsh and unconscionable. Right. My point is okay. that it doesn't just apply to rental increases. It's actually the initial rent charge by a landlord, potential rent charge at any time, not just an increase. And because of that, um, one of the considerations that we as a body have to consider is whether or not we should require that there be more than a simple majority in light of the fact that the powers that are given to this particular commission are far reaching, quite impactful, and um, to the extent that we're, we're not just, you know, we're not applying this to the most egregious circumstance where a, t a landlord increases the rent threefold. That That is absolutely something that this commission should be able to address. I'm more concerned about um, the use of this commission as a weapon against landlords to be able to charge um, a market rent. And, you know, the considerations in the ordinance and in the model statute consider things like the income of the tenant and some other things. So. You know, what's unconscionable to one person is not necessarily unconscionable to another. And for that reason, I think we have to be very careful when we're infringing upon, you know, the free market rights of landlords. And we don't want to discourage landlords because they're needed as well based upon, you know, the way of the state. It seems like rental properties are being what's quite frankly being pushed here. So uh, for all those reasons, I think that we really need to take a serious look at whether or not we require more than a simple majority. And I'm going to I'm going to revisit that next week when we meet and ask. No, I understand that that, that, that consideration. And, and again, there are some communities that do require a supermajority in order to make a finding. Thank I believe you. it's only one community right now, Stratford. I believe so far every other community in the state that has um, complied with the statute and done a commission ordinance has 
it doesn't have that super majority unless there's been some development but but that's something we'll, we'll we can talk about i don't think mark um you know can interject much about that but i it is something we could talk about thank you representative zesma Thank you, uh, Liz Esmer, District 4. Hi, Mark. So my, I have a question and a comment. The question is um, either for you, Mark, or for Representative Wackerman. Thus far, since it has been uh, determined that towns and cities over 20,000 in population must form a commission, where have these ordinances failed? For what reason? And um, or what are good examples of cases where something like this was used inappropriately? Um, I'm not aware of ordinances that are failed, but again, I haven't done an exhaustive search of um, other communities that are under the same pressure that we are to comply with state statute and determining you know, what the course of action. I, I looked at those communities who had established, there has been enabling legislation for many years that allow communities uh, that cho chose to to establish fair rent commissions, and there were some that were uh, comparable in size to to ours, uh, to our community. And so I looked at the experience from those commissions, but uh, haven't looked at those that are in the same boat as Fairfield at this point. Thank you, um, Representative Wackerman. Do you know of any examples? I don't. I haven't heard of any. Okay, thank you. And then my, my comment is it is it seems almost impossible that if a landlord is truly charging a market rate, and that's easy to establish, by the way, mm -hmm. that anybody would try to use a commission inappropriately against them. Those two don't add up. Mm -hmm. Only if a landlord is either initially charging a rate that's well outside the market or is increasing at a level that is well outside the market. But, I mean, just to um, Representative McCormick's comment, it's impossible to have somebody bring a, haul a landlord before this commission and say, they're charging me the market rate, but I just don't like it. Well, people can file a complaint uh, whether or not the commission finds any, war uh, any merit in that complaint is another matter. So both, uh, both parties have the opportunity to present evidence to support their case, but you couldn't prevent somebody from actually filing a complaint and claiming that the rent they're being charged is unconscionable. That is correct, but once the due diligence is done, it's hard for me to believe a commission is going to find in favor of a tenant under those exact circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Georgiatis. Drew Georgiatis, uh, District 9. Um, just a comment. Um, we're all, you know, hear about inflation all the time. Some of the three highest indicators are um, housing costs, which would be rent or other housing costs, gas, food. Um, and, you know, for that reason, there's a lot of nationwide push to keep um, housing costs under control, which I'm sure is one of the reasons they're establishing a fair rent commission. Um, also, I think the language, as far as I read it, that um, Representative McCormick was doing, whether it's uh, rent increase or rent, once you hear of your rent increase, um, you can go on for a couple of months negotiating with that landlord, and you could you shouldn't have to move out be, if you can't resolve it before you move into your new lease, which would then be rent and rent increase. So that might be the sort of um, straddling language that leaves you, you know, prior and after. So that, I support that language. Thank you. Representative Steele. Jeff Steele, District 2. Um, I understand what Representative McCormick said. Certainly we want to guard against just what you said, uh, preventing someone from charging market rate. Um, I understand what Representative Zesma said that makes sense. I mean, no one's probably going to do that, right? No one's going to, like, right. Couldn't we then, and would it make sense to just take out rental charge, but leave in proposed increase in rental charge? And then, I mean, is it, can, can we do that? That seems like it would solve the problem, or is that, can we well, not? Well, we're echoing the, the statute. That was language from the statute. So I think we should be using the same terms they use 
and I and hopefully they'll define that if there's any question about it. I mean, is there, is there so we so, cannot put our mark on it at all? I mean, do we know that? Do we do we know that's the case? Um, I think for things that um, for defined terms like that or terms that are used there, we should use we should keep their language, but we can change something. So it would depend on what we're talking about. Okay, well, that, well that, that's, that's what we're talking about. That's what I'm asking about. Right, and I, yeah. the one you're asking about, I, I would argue that it's um, a statutory language, so it should not, um, and I'm actually double checking the statute now, so Thanks. it should not be taken out. Thank you, Representative Longo. Hi, Melissa Longo, District 1. Um, I just, I have a question about what Representative Wackerman just said about the language. Do we have a lawyer who's looking into this if we do or if we can actually change the language or do we have to follow exactly what is coming down from the state? Um, I'm curious about that. Do you know the answer to that? I couldn't fully understand what you said. I'm sorry. You're wondering if 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 we, we have can a, change it. Oh, yes, oh, yes. If, if it's mandated by the state that we keep this language, or is it possible that we can change it? Do we know for sure? And do we have someone who is a lawyer in this arena or who can advise the commission? Uh, well, um, Mr. Baldwin did take a look at that. Um, there, it's not, um, let's see. So the statute doesn't say here, you know, everything in the statute doesn't go into the ordinance, but it does have specific, like it defines rental charge. I'm looking at that now. Um, it has, you know, specific language about what the, the commission has to be able to do. Um, so, you know, I, I do this for a living, you know, so I just, we read the statute, we created an ordinance that reflects what's required by the statute. So, um, I, you know, you can ask I, Mr. Um, our, our town attorney looked at it and he was fine with it. So, um, okay. So, so I, that didn't really answer my question, but okay. Um, and then I guess my other tell comment, me what, tell me what I, didn't I, I guess just specifically, what are we allowed to change? What aren't we like what representative Steele was saying is, well, would we get in trouble or is it, may, are we required to follow that? exact language in that little part or is it can the commission use that or can we as a body use that under our discretion to ch make some changes as we have already i would argue that we should leave that because that's the language that was used in the in the statute um and if we don't i mean get in trouble i mean i guess it could be challenged by uh, a tenant or a landlord if if the use of that the not the lack of use of that word ever became an issue in a lawsuit. Um, okay. okay. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to comment was that there's a lot of things that come before this body with an intent. Um, and I, I don't, I think it would be better for us, better for the commission, better for the people of the town to have a supermajority because there is so much gray in this and it makes me uncomfortable. And I think that anyone can bring forth to this commission if they're feeling like they're being treated unfairly. And I, I just don't see how this is helping landlords as much as it's helping tenants. Um, and I don't, I really hope that we can discuss this next week. So thank you. I think it is intended to mainly help tenants, not to punish landlords, but um, I think I speak for the sponsors of the, the ordinance when I say that um, we really feel like a, a super majority would make it harder for a tenant to get relief. And if three people on the on the uh, commission believe that it's um, you know unconscionable and believe that the tenant deserves some kind of relief, that's that's okay. I mean, that's sort of the normal vote in almost every single one of our boards and commissions. So um, we don't think it should have to be made harder for the tenant. And it's already a high bar, as Representative Zezima said, we'll know what the fair rent is. The members of the commission will, will have studies if they need them. They'll have that information accessible to them. So it's not like it's in a vacuum where they can just make up 
you know, whether it's unconscionable or not. Thank you, Representative Kerber. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the fact that I think it wouldn't make sense to take out rent charged because, or, or rental charge, because there seems to be two aspects of this. One is rental increase, but the other is the condition of the home and uh, of the unit. And if, you know, it, it, we don't want slumlords in this, in this town, and if the um, unit becomes dilapidated, the rent may stay the same, but is no longer charging a market rate. So I think um, I think it's important to keep that in because there are those two aspects of it: it's the condition, and it's also the increase. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Representative Myers. Uh, Jim Myers, District Eight. Um, with regard to the supermajority, um, is that something that is just being decided by the sponsors, or is that something you're considering? Um, handed down by the state? Is that something you're willing to compromise on? Because that seems like a big issue in this room. That's that's not a state requirement. It's just what the sponsors feel strongly is is the right way to go and what's consistent with how everything else in town is with maybe one exception. And are you willing, are you willing to compromise on that? I'm not personally, and I, I don't think the sponsors are. I, I don't want to make this harder for tenants. You know, I, I understand the concern about landlords being taken for granted, but this was enacted to protect tenants who are being taken for granted. So we don't want to make it harder for them. It, it still has to follow the, the standards that are explained in the statute, you know, unconscionable or things, you know, serious problems with the building or whatever. But um, we just don't, I, we don't see why it should be harder, you know, harder than it is for any other thing to pass in the RTM or any other board or commission in town, pretty much. But, uh, and there's, as I mentioned, as far as I know, there's only Stratford that is, um, uh, do, that has a um, super majority. Every other town that's done this has just a simple majority. So I don't see why we should follow that minority. All right, I'll just leave this last comment that, you know, we, I, I strongly believe that if it's unconscionable, it will not be difficult to get a supermajority. And we said it, we said this a month ago and I still feel that way today. Representative Horton. Representative Horton, District 9. Um, I just wanted to remind me that in terms of the makeup of the commission, um, one of the members does in fact need to be a landlord. So it, it is something um, that is important in terms of representing all points of view. And I just want to remind people of that. Thank you, Representative Georgiatis. I want to address the definition of supermajority in this instance. Um, three out of five, the simple majority is already 60%. Um, four out of five, which I assume is what you're calling a supermajority, would be 80%. And that if the landlord is the fifth, you, you almost already have a supermajority at 60%. So asking for 80% is, is a very, very, very high bar, way above the traditional definition of supermajority. Thank you. Representative Zesma. Thank you, Liz Esma, District 4. I think further Representative Steele and Representative Longo's questions, my, um, my question is to Representative Wackerman. I think when you are modeling um, an ordinance after a state statute, isn't it the case that it has to be equal to or exceeds um, the statute and cannot be less than, or is that only for a particular, like noise ordinance I know, very clearly is is one that meets that criteria. Um, sorry for all the motion. My my computer is dying. Um, I wouldn't say exceeds. I mean, we it depends on the situation, but um, y yeah, you have to make sure that you're um, have you have all the responsibilities and rights and requirements that are in the statute um, in your in your ordinance. So. Um, 
you know, to, like rental charges is a defined term and it's in, in the statute and it's used for a particular purpose. So to take that out would undermine the purpose of the statute to some extent. Right, right. I mean, it would also be a violation. It, it is not something that, that we can do. Yeah, it's true. It, it would be not, it would be not following the statute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Representative McCormick. Um, just briefly in response to the comment that um, one of the commission members must be a landlord, the language in the stat, the ordinance, proposed ordinance is that priority will be given to um, uh, place a landlord on the commission, but it's not actually mandatory and there is potential that we won't get a landlord to serve on this. So it's not a definite that there'll be a landlord. It's, it's also a little bit offensive, I think, to suggest that because somebody is a landlord on the commission, that they're automatically gonna vote in favor of a landlord and they're not gonna be impartial uh, on the commission. I think that that's really um, just unacceptable to even suggest that. I think anybody who takes an oath to serve on a commission does so to serve in a capacity to be neutral and to uh, decide each case on a case-by-case -case basis without a prejudice for one side or the other. So that's one comment there. And with respect to, um, you know, Representative Wackerman was asked, I think, um, at least twice by Representative Longo whether or not there's a way, has she consulted as the, as the uh, have the sponsors consulted with any legal counsel to get an affirmative answer as to whether or not there is an ability to change the model uh, language and it seemed like she said, um, you know, the, the 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 response to that that I heard was, well, we feel that it should be this way, and we feel, and and then when she was asked by a follow up question by Representative Zesma, all of a sudden she says, oh yes, absolutely, we can't change the language. So I would just ask that between now and next week, um, if somebody could consult with either uh, the town attorney or. Um, the sponsors could consult with the town attorney to figure out whether or not that language regarding rental charge versus um, having it in or out is, is acceptable. And the last point I want to make is that, you know, the fair market value of these, these uh, properties is only one of 13 considerations to be taken up by the commission. And that's one, and it's a big one, but there's, there's 12 others, and presumably the income of the, the tenant is one of those those uh, uh, those examples or, or the one of those criteria that can be used to determine the egregiousness of a rental charge. And I will use that example again, that somebody who loses their job after, you know, having a, a relatively high paying job and no longer has the ability to pay a high rent could be found by this commission to be uh, somebody who's entitled to relief under this ordinance the way it's written. And I don't think that that should be given out um, very lightly. It should be uh, after full consideration and contemplation and in accordance with uh, Mr. Myers, Representative Myers' comments, if it's really that egregious and that onerous and that uh, unacceptable and offensive to the average person, then it should be no problem finding four out of five people to find in favor of the tenant. That's it. Karen, I just wanted to correct something you said. I, I did say to... Um, Representative Longo that um, the town attorney reviewed this, the ordinance and approved it. He had a couple of comments, which we responded to. Um, and I think, you know, you're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, and we do understand how statutes have to be implemented. Um, so I, if you have a question for the town attorney, you should ask the moderator and he can forward it to that town attorney. But um, I will. I will. The, the question, question specifically was whether or not you had or have or are willing to ask whether or not that particular language can be changed. And your response was, we don't feel like we want to. Basically, that was your response. Oh, okay, I'll change it. I, I thought I was pretty clear. No, you can't change it because it's in the statute. I, I told you that I was looking at the statute. <sighs> Representative Pastilli. Representative Pastilli, uh, District 3. Um, this is probably about the third time that this has happened where right before a vote, all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of comments and input on an ordinance. And this is supposed to be a deliberative body where we have co-sponsors, hopefully from both parties, where we come forward and bring our best ideas and we compromise. 
And so going forward, I think it would be really great if we can get sponsors from both sides of the aisle rather than just having these long, contentious conversations at 9.30 p.m. when the homework could have been done months ago. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Longo. Representative Longo, District 1, um, it is our job to sit here and ask questions and ask for clarification so that we can make an accurate vote so we have all of our questions answered. And I think it's kind of, I mean, at this point, to try to make this a partisan political issue is just, I mean, ridiculous. I don't even think that that's necessary. If there are people that wanted to be on this commission, they would be. We are here to ask questions and to find out information. That's what this body does. If we're going to go back and forth tit for tat, I'm not going to do it. So if everybody's done with this, I'm not, I'm not doing it tonight. I'm not. You know what? I mean, it's very obvious. One side wants one, one, one wants the other. So let's, if you have any more questions concerning the ordinance, Representative Gale, you have a question concerning the ordinance. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> uh, Karen, this is actually for you, I believe. Um, so, you know, I'm sitting here trying to think of all the scenarios of what's going on in the future. And the truth of the matter is, is that more and more, you know, we're going to see these large buildings that are being, you know, managed by these corporations. And they do charge insanely exorbitant rents. And I'm actually, you know, going to be glad that there is going to be a commission where people can go to um, to challenge it. I One of the things that I think is missing, though, is I don't see, like, a under, uh, what section is this, section three, where you have these conditions. I don't see something about safety, like in terms of fire safety, sorry, fire safety and things like that. And I was wondering if you would consider putting in um, something about that. Um, and then the, on the other side, <laughs> like where I'm slightly concerned is, you know, I've never been a landlord, but I can imagine that sometimes you would get a tenant who would just, you know, people just, use the law to try to get whatever they can out of a, out of a person or out of a situation and is are you considering like you know I, I don't want to see like someone use this to drag on a proceeding um, you know in a way that exploits the 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 ordinance so is there some sort of a time limit that you're you know that the, you know the landlord could you know be guaranteed a, a timely trial or, or hearing or whatever it is sorry not a trial yeah, uh, yeah, I can answer both of those. So uh, already in the ordinance, based on the statute, um, there one of the considerations when the commission is looking at the rent is to consider whether the accommodations are in compliance with ordinances and statutes about health and safety. So that would include fire, you know, all kinds of safety issues. And there are time constraints. There's, you know, thir within thirty days, this has to happen within. 15 days that has to happen that's near the end of the i think it's section six no section seven yeah i apologize, I apologize for that. thank you <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you any other questions on the ordinance question thank you representative gerber no tit for tat no tit for that. um <laughs> Um, Mr. Barnhart, Bill Gerber, District 2. I, I'm curious, um, from what you've seen in other towns, people that you talk to, is part of the problem when you have like a undocumented um, tenants and they're being taken advantage of, they're in a vulnerable position, and does this actually help them in any way? Or um, Not that I am aware of. Um, I didn't go into that level of detail. I had some conversation with uh, West Hartford in terms of the performance of their commission. They seem fairly active and they're relatively the same size as Fairfield. Um, other than that, I was just looking at uh, the level of complaints or activity levels in terms of number of meetings that commissions had. And some are very um, inactive. Uh, but others uh, meet regularly and have a uh, number of do uh, number of complaints before them. 
thing. It runs the gamut. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. We done? Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Karen. Uh, noise ordinance, Representative Vergara. Um, Jill Vergara for District 7. I'm one of the co-sponsors for the revisions to the noise ordinance being um, proposed. Uh, I didn't come prepared to do a full representation um, and, and um, summary of everything that the ordinance does. I, I did want to say that I think that um, we've shown how much work has gone into this and um, we've really tried to be responsive to everybody and um, really aim to try to get to the middle ground. Um, I think that that will create a good ordinance. So I hope we've done that. Um, I did present last time how many changes have been made and I'm proud of that. Um, and we will continue to work with some of uh, the uh, issues that people have raised from um, our, pa our past committee meeting. My understanding is that I can't propose revisions at this point. So um, my intent is to present some revisions um, in response to everyone at our meeting on the floor next, uh, next week. And so I thought I'd just tell you all what um, will be responsive to and hopefully be able to, in advance of the meeting, send a, a, like a summary of those changes that I hope to um, uh, propose amendments for. So uh, one of them is for 78.6 in the enforcement section. I think Captain Waya raised the issue that he thought it was a problem to not have an appeals process. So I did have a conversation with um, the town attorney Baldwin, and he does not think that it's an issue, but he did say that he thought it would be better if our ordinance uh, called the infraction citations instead. So um, we will make that change. We'll, in that section, we'll change all of the references to infractions to citations. In 78.7, several members have raised the issue of refuse collection, so we will be expanding the um, exclusion for garbage collection to uh, include more early morning hours. Um, in 78.8, in the specific prohibitions, uh, I think it was Representative Steele, who, or, or Representative Bateson, I can't remember, who raised the issue of golf courses, and so we'll increase uh, we'll include golf courses in the carve out for the um, yard maintenance. Um, and I had an idea of um, something in response to Representative Steele. I'm not sure if it's not palatable to everybody. I don't want to, it to affect the ordinance. And so, but um, at LNA, Representative Steele ha had um, an idea of having a specific prohibition for leaf blowers that focused not on property owners, but on companies. And so it would be targeting more the volume. So it would be a prohibition on the number of blowers on a property at a time. And in that, at certain, and then it would restrict the times for that activity for any more than one leaf blower on a property. And that, in that way, it would not be a single property owner trying to maintain their own yard. 
it's really just companies who do that and um, have multiple leaf blowers. And that also produces more of the noise. And I think that's generally what a lot of people complain about. So it's an idea. Um, and we can talk more about it offline if you want, Representative Steele. I also wanted to point out that I added in the backup the state statutory language. And um, I've gotten some questions about any particular data and analysis of that data that we've done. And that can be found in the supplemental documents um, that we provided. It, sh it should be in the backup. Okay, thank you, Jill. Any questions, comments about what was uh, Representative Steele? Jeff Steele, District 2. Um, thank you, Jill, for that update and some of these changes I think make sense. Um, the, um, yeah, I think we did talk about the blowers. We also talked, and we can discuss this at committee, but we talked about carving out potentially summer hours because it's really just an issue during the summer. It's not like it's a year-round issue. Um, that was one thing. Um, the other thing we talked about were, um, or we have not yet talked about, but did you discuss this with Anthony in terms of the impact on public events that could or have been going to 11 in the past that would now be down to 10? And does that impact revenue? And I think it. I haven't had a, a per, what, I haven't sorry. had a private conversation okay, with. I'm asking Jill. Yeah. I, I haven't had a private conversation with Anthony. Um, I was hoping that he could maybe provide some kind of alternative language and um, I never received any kind of communication from him e either. Um, I know the baseline for, I know changes need to be made to protect these property owners and that something like that can't happen again. And um, I think it's an important change to make. So he would have to then, you know, or people who would have parties after 10 would have to apply for a variance to go to 11s. Well, or is the way that it is now, it nighttime hours should have always been enforced. And um, to be in compliance with state law, it, the nighttime hours should be beginning at 10 PM. Um, and by, I, it, we need to comply with that. OK. So in the, the supplemental memorandum on April 24th, you had mentioned in kind of the preamble to all of this, our original goals was one, to assist in police enforcement, um, two, to broaden protections to include daytime hours, which we've talked about, and three, to respond to constituent concerns. And I know last committee meeting I had asked you and Representative Gior Georgiadis about this data that might have been Alyssa Israel talked about, and we discussed it by email. And one of you both said, one or both of you said, uh, yeah, we, we've got plenty of data we can share. Is that the data you're referring to in the supplemental that only talks about kind of every day, hours of the day, and which days? The There's noise two sets of um, charts. One was specific to a particular year. I don't, I mean, it's kind of mixed in with all of my stuff. There's a year that um, Ms. Israel analyzed and was able to kind of um, segregate different areas of town and then also identify certain activities that uh, involve, were involved with the noise complaint. For the other set of data, it spans a broader period of time. I think it's four to five years. Yeah, and I saw that. Because yeah. um, it, it requires hand pulling, I think, those complaints. So that's more generalized. and we didn't have, so the more specific information is just for that year. And then the analysis for the four to five years is on that general breakdown for the supporting documents. Okay, so the data that I have in front of me, I think it was from the police department, talks about the noise complaints and number of complaints over the last three years, even by road. But you're talking about there's another data set that might have come from Ms. Israel about specific complaints in specific regions of town? Because I, I haven't seen that. Yeah, I, it should have been included that. in the backup. Um, I didn't see that. I have the backup data that I printed out. And it's here, time of day, complaints per month, just for 20, uh, 1118 to 1119. So a one-year period from November. Basically, I'm just looking for this data. And I, it, it, 
Well, other than the, you, it, we've talked it, about other data, I just don't know if there, there is other data or is there not other data? There has always been this data on the supporting docs, which is, it's, it has it in the title and at the footer that says supporting docs, noise ordinance, 129-2023, and it's um, 12 pages. And it gives a breakdown for a lot of different information related to noise ordinances. And then if I, if you all don't have that other specific sheet that breaks it down in the year for where things are occurring and what types of activities are involved, that was an oversight. And um, I had thought that I had sent that to the town clerk maybe two months ago. So if that wasn't included, um, I will I will add that to the backup again. I, mean, I, that, I apologize. That would be great. Maybe we could talk at committee and I could just show you the date at least I've seen and I have because I would love to see what you're talking about. Okay. Um, it would be really useful and probably be useful for everyone here. If it is just a snapshot, yeah. a one-year period in time, I don't know how useful that would be today. Really? I mean, if it's three or four years ago, probably not as useful. There was COVID. There were different issues then. There were probably different number of complaints of people being in their homes. Well, this so, is from 2019, what she analyzed the okay. year, and um, that's what Four it should be ago. entitled if it is in the backup analysis of noise complaints in 2019. Okay, okay. so there's been nothing. Uh, all right, I'd love to see that because I just I haven't seen okay. it anywhere, and I have all this other data here, um, let alone it's, you know, it's four years ago, and I see there's already changes in the noise complaints from 2021 to 2023. Anyways, I'd love to see that. I think the data is important here. The only other question I had, and I, I see the chief is here, um, I would just like to ask through the moderator to, um, to Chief Calamaris, what, if this were to pass, what would be the impact on day-to-day -day operations or enforcement for, for your team, for the, for the officers? How would that impact this? How would this impact that? Well, the noise, noise complaints consist of less than 1% of our calls for the year. Um, um, you have the, probably have the data that uh, Captain Wyatt uh, put together several years ago that uh, showed, you know, it's, it's a, a couple of calls in the 55,000 or so calls that we get per year. Um, COVID or 2020 was a significant year where we saw, saw a big spike in, um, in noise complaints. Uh, primarily, the majority of the complaints that we sh see noise uh, where we get complaints from uh, community members and actually go down and enforce it is uh, in the beach area. We identify the beach area from Edward Street South, uh, although in the last couple of years since we've implemented uh, Burr Homestead, we have gotten several complaints about parties that have been implemented for um, through the Parks and Rec Department. Um, how does this affect day-to-day -day operations? Um, you know, I think one of the, one of the significant uh, pieces of the legislation that's being proposed is that um, it takes away officer discretion or limits it in a sense to where uh, if a second violation occurs within a one-year period, an officer would be required to give um, enforcement action, which could be, uh, I think you're changing the word to infraction or citation? Okay. Or from infraction to citation? Or from citation to infraction? <laughs> we, we refer to it as an infraction. So it's an infractionable offense. We use, in most cases, uh, disorderly conduct, which is a state statute. Most of the time, that's, that's what the officers issue when they're, when they're down mostly at the beach. Um, so when you, when you take away officer's discretion, every scenario uh, has to be evaluated on its own merit. And when officers respond to a call, there are cases where um, they can establish probable cause but still may only require a warning. Um, especially if the uh, individual who's at the household, for whatever reason, the noise complaint comes in, and they would get, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they would, you know, get the complaint, evaluate the complaint, 
and uh, give a fair and unbiased assessment of the situation and then evaluate it on its merit and determine if there's a uh, enough probable cause to make an arrest. If they don't feel, or even if there is probable cause, they could still give that person a warning. Um, if the same, sure, an infraction is an arrestable, it's, an arrest is, is, I'm seizing you for the moment, I could be writing you an infraction, I could be putting handcuffs on you and bringing you in. So it's all, it's all considered the same thing. Um, and, and there's a due process for each, whether it's an infraction or it's a full custodial arrest, there's due process for each of those scenarios. So I think discretion is probably one of the biggest concerns that we have, that if an officer responded on one occasion for a certain incident and then maybe several weeks later for a different incident, the officer, according to the, the new proposed statute, would be required to uh, make an arrest on that in that incident, and that could be an infraction. Um, so the reason why we decided to change the 24-hour reset that existed in the ordinance is that the 24-hour reset was a very novel thing. Um, we couldn't find it anywhere in our code, and we couldn't find it anywhere else in anyone else's ordinances anywhere. Um, we were worried that it would not help this ordinance to function as some kind of um, preventative thing. Like, uh, we don't want recidivism. And if people can just have a clean the um, slate within 24 hours, it sort of defeats the whole purpose of having something like this. So we looked around and really tried to get be um, moderate and, and take and go the middle ground. And our alarm ordinance has a one year reset. And we thought that that was very reasonable. Norwalk has a one year reset as well. Just, just as a follow up, so it, it sounds like the most, well, one of the biggest impacts is, is just impacting the discretion. I mean, that was mentioned. For enforcement, and it's a very specific issue. Um, it doesn't have to do with the metered, uh, uh, it doesn't have to do with the rest of the ordinance. It just has to do with the enforcement and administration. And it is an aspect that we actually researched and we couldn't find anything like that in anyone else's ordinance. Yeah, I wasn't referring specifically to the 24 hour thing. I was saying the general ordinance itself, as I heard, it impacts discretion for the officers and how to respond and how to deal with situations. Literally only for repeat offenders. That is literally only what uh, it affects for discretion. But, is, but that's, that's your opinion, that it is in, only impacts in that 24, I'm talking the whole the whole concept of responding. Well, to then noise. you're putting words into that's just what I, that's just what I Chief that's, Calamaris's mouth no, no, because I'm, I'm he, paraphrasing. he pointed directly to that language that had to do with enforcing it within a year. So it's not what he said. I never commented on that. I never commented on that language. He was using that as one example. Representative Georgiatis. Drew Georgiatis, um, District 9. I, um, you said that all the complaints are from the beach area. Um, when we add the daytime hours, I've gotten a lot of emails from Sacred Heart uh, residents um, because there's a lot of daytime um, amplified noise there. Um, so I'd like to um, have you address um, those concerns for those residents, and I'd also like to follow up on Mr. Steele's, Representative Steele's comment of how this will affect your daily, um, impact you, the police on a daily basis, because um, you're here to protect and serve. So um, maintaining 
the sort of the community and um, not having to have the community exposed to excessive noise, I would think would fall under your general um, job description for no better reason than that. I'd like you to address that and if you and, and your support for that. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I didn't say that. I said most of the calls for noise are at the beach area, and that is a true statement. Um, uh, anecdotally, I could probably pull statistics and and get more specific. Um, if the if that the body would would like me to do that, I could do that. Um, secondly, I I agree with you that noise and safety is a a job function of a police officer when someone calls the police we are to respond and mitigate whatever problems that they're having at the time uh, and if that is noise then we do respond and we do enforce there's only one statute in the state of Connecticut right now that says you shall enforce and that is the domestic violence statutes so um, to take a noise ordinance um, in fact I'll just add that even mental health issues when we are required to or I won't say required because we're never required, but when we are um, in a position where we may have to take someone who has uh, in, in uh, danger to themselves or others, even that statute, and we experience that in Fairfield very often, uh, does not say that we shall take them into custody and send them to a medical facility for treatment. Um, it's only domestic violence laws. So it, it's concerning to me that um, a noise ordinance should have the words shall, an officer shall make an arrest in certain circumstances. Thank you. Representative Zesma. Thank you, Liz Zesma, District 4. Thanks to both of you. And uh, quickly, Jill, I think the nighttime hour revisions do reflect what we were saying before. You can't weaken a statute. So that 10, right. right? Yeah, it's, it's a matter of complying with um, the state statutory language yep. right um, yeah and and as it is right now we're not enforcing it so right well that was my other question I did appreciate Captain Wyatt's answer in the affirmative um, the last time we met and he was asked if he felt this would and I'm paraphrasing that discussion this would provide the police department with more and better tools I think for me what I'm seeing is you guys are doing what you can within you know your mandated responsibility to enforce, and yet we're not seeing complaints go down. So if it were working, I think we would see a lessening of outreach both to you, to the police department, and to us. I think there are people who don't necessarily contact the police. They do reach out to, to their district representatives, so there may be a mismatch between where they're all coming from and how many. but. Pandemic aside, which is an outlier in all of this data, I mean, would you agree that just doing business as usual, we don't seem to be discouraging, preventing, preempting, mitigating what's going on? Well, a noise complaint is based on environmental conditions. There's the one, the person who hears the noise and feels that it's egregious, and there's you know, the, the person who's emitting the noise. Uh, second to that, the beach area, which is where most of our calls come from, is a transient environment. Most of the students are transient every year. So there's a new senior group down there every single year. So the conditions persist. Um, we do our best to, uh, we do a lot of enforcement um, especially when it relates to uh, student activities. Um, and there are times when we, as the police, are weaponized by some of the residents that are down there. And they're calling incessantly, and we're finding no, um, we're finding no noise. So it goes both ways. But are you finding no noise or no public disturbance or breach of peace because you're not using a decibel level? So right now, according to the ordinance that we have in effect, you're, you're not finding no noise. You're just going to see whether there's a breach of peace or public disturbance. Uh, 
Well, we have to establish probable cause in order to make an arrest. So it's the observations of the officer and the environmental conditions that are presented to him at the time of the, the offense. So if someone just says, I heard a loud noise, are we, are we making the arrest based on the noise that already occurred or the conditions that we see when we're there? I would think that it would require the noise to be continuing, but from what people are saying and writing in is that they make these complaints, and we can see it from the data itself. There's never been an enforcement action based on our noise ordinance, so we know, and we know that a decibel level is not kept in, you know, as a staple in every in, in every patrol car. So um, it, it's just not being read the way. It's supposed to be, and that's okay. You know, I I can work with that, and that's what we're trying to do is to tr try to provide the police with tools like a plainly audible standard that would enable them to hopefully enforce an ordinance that um, was passed and ha it is going. You know, hopefully will be passed again um, because this is uh, largely what the community wants. They, 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 they have issues with noise. They, this is a nuisance. It affects quality of life. And it doesn't always go to the point, an extreme point, of reaching um, a public disturbance or breach of peace. Thank you both. I'm all set. Thank you. Representative Gerber. Um, Bill Gerber, District 2. Jill, I, I don't see anything about arrests. In, I mean, this is an administration. These are fines. Where, where does it say there's an arrest? I haven't, um, arrest is disorderly conduct. You can get three months for disorderly conduct. But for this, it's all fines in this ordinance. As far as I'm aware, it's just it's a fine. And I suppose if someone doesn't pay their fine, they can be brought to court. Yeah, and yeah, no, um, it, with further action, maybe there, there, there's nothing know. right. There's nothing in here about arrests. This is um, and and the state. I mean, I have reviewed the, the state noise ordinance and the state um, disorderly conduct rules. And the disorderly conduct, which is what you're used to enforcing, it you can get three months for that. But for the noise ordinance, it's it's not uh, it's not punishable by arrest. So. We're really talking about fines, and I'm just confused because the disorderly conduct and and noise are they're not necessarily the same thing. They're they're two different things. They're both state. One's a state administrative regulation, but it it, it carries the full weight of law as far as I know. And someone here correct me if a uh, you know, we, we have the fill pile, that's under department, that's under DEEP. This is under DEEP. This is a regulation under DEEP. So I didn't think we had a choice, <laughs> really. So th that, that's why I'm confused. We're having all these discussions. Do we like it? What's the data? Whatever. It's all interesting, but are we going to follow the law or not? And, and, and for me, like, if we're a, a, a town of laws, like, this is the law. Like, we have to... You know, we have to have a, a daytime threshold that's at least as stringent as the states, and we have to like start our our our, our nighttime hours at ten o'clock. Like, I don't really understand what the choice is, and I feel bad because we're all debating this, and it seems like unnecessary strife because it's the law. Like, we don't have a choice. So my 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 problem um, is really that we have a, a state law, a state regulation. We probably screwed up when we wrote the municipal ordinance because it's not in compliance with state law, with state regulation. So we have to change it to be in compliance, and it has to be at least as as stringent as the state as the state regulation. So that's what you're doing, um, and I guess the conversation that I would like to have is really what this is going to do to the chiefs officers like how how are they going to be able to handle this is going to be a big problem does it really have to be handled by his officers could we outsource it somewhere else there's all different ways of doing this different towns from what i've seen you know could have different people just with meters but if the only reason that i see that you've put in um that you have put in a plainly audible standard if if 
the officers were carrying meters, then it would be an objective measurement and we wouldn't need to have a plainly audible standard. I, I do foresee that, you know, maybe this is not the best use of, of your people, of your officers' time. And, and so that's the conversation I think we would be having, not whether or not we should put this in place, because we, we, we kind of have to, right? So I just don't think, you know, uh, this isn't the, the hill I want to die on. And pro there's plenty of things to protest against the state. I don't think this is really one of them. This is not an antiquated law. It was, re it was revised in 2015. There were changes made again last year. <laughs> so it's, like, it's not like Deep isn't like thinking about this. This is something that the state wants us to do. And you know, whether, like it or not, I think we have to do it. Representative Gail. Thank you so much, Hannah Gail, District 6. So I just want to say that um, there are many laws that are on the books that are regularly not enforced. In fact, you know, that's how laws tend to be changed, is that in practical living terms, the public starts to behave differently than a law, and eventually sometimes you hit a point where juries just cease to convict because the law no longer reflects what people are doing. We're concentrating on this, you know, in a way that is guaranteed to cause problems in our town. You know, I, I understand that there are some situations in the beach area, whatever, you know, but these people that are complaining are really the squeaky wheels. And for the most part, no, our, our residents do not want this ordinance. All of the conversations that I've had with constituents are along the lines of please don't make our police into the noise police. Our town is fine the way it is, and all of these changes are going to make things unpleasant. And so, you know, I, I just disagree that this really, we must do this right now. This is absurd. Thank you. Representative McCormick. Um, Chief, just, I want to be clear about this. I thought I heard you say that the, um, the representation of noise complaints is, makes up about 1% of the total calls that the department gets every year. Is that, did I hear that correctly? It's less than 1%. Okay, less than 1%. And I would imagine, just based upon my 50-something years walking the planet, that you're never going to completely eradicate sort of um, non-compliant behavior entirely, right? There's always going to be a few in the crowd that are probably going to be non-compliant with whatever it is, whether it's a law, a rule, or regulation. Is that a fair statement? That's fair. Okay, so at some point, we have to ask ourselves, are we going to impose restrictions on people's freedoms? And there's a lot more in here than just talking about having a party at the beach or students being loud, but at what point are we going to say to ourselves that we're not going to throw a blanket problem across the entire town when you have clearly stated, and I trust what you're saying, that the noise complaints make up less than 1% of all the calls, and they generally speaking come from one area of town, and yet we're going to impose all sorts of regulations, including things re regarding uh, dump haulers and lawnmowers and what time you can mow your lawn and what time you can't. And to me, I still think that this, this ordinance as proposed far oversteps any kind of reasonableness in terms of trying to regulate the few people in our town that just don't understand that you have to respect your neighbors after certain hours. So, I mean, for all these reasons, I, you know, this, the comment that this is largely what the community wants, I would echo Representative Gale's comments. I've probably gotten all in maybe 20 emails uh, out of 55,000 residents. Some of them, I will say, of the 20 have been duplicates. I've probably gotten 10 from three or four people down on Fairfield Beach Road. So, um, you know, I, I just can't see supporting such a wide uh, sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater solution to a problem that represents less than 1% of our town's population. To me, it's another overstepping of the government. It's getting involved in people's lives excessively. I'm not saying I wouldn't support 
some of what's in here, but I definitely can't support the way it's written right now and as far-reaching as it goes. And for all those reasons, I will not support it based upon the amendments that you're proposing. I think the discretion taken away from our police department is unacceptable. They have a hard enough job as it is, and to not give them discretion to do their jobs is to me absurd. And I think it's offensive to state in this forum that the police are not enforcing the law. That to me, there are people that are always going to be unhappy with, with the enforcement. But for the most part, this chief and his officers, as far as I can see, do an awesome job in regulating behavior and making sure that we're all safe and, and living peacefully. And, and, and to suggest that they're not doing their job, and I've heard it more, on more than one occasion in this, uh, in this body, last month I think we heard it as well, it, to me that's unacceptable. And, and I applaud your efforts and I... Uh, uh, point I, I of order, I think you are ascribing something to this members of this body that was not uttered at all tonight. I actually said that the chief and his department were doing all they could to comply with the staff. Who, I, we're we're, we're, we're going to move on to Representative Woke. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So now that I've heard everybody's complaints about this ordinance, I've been getting, uh, first of all, I'm Jay Walk from District 5. Anyway, and I'm sure everybody knows it, right, right Hannah? Um, I've been getting letters in favor of the ordinance in, in, in certain, I got involved in this whole ordinance from, from a complaint about lawnmowers. That's how I got into this. When I was the president of my condominium, like you know, in Dogwood Green for many years, we, I was getting complaints, phone calls, that our gardeners were starting too early in the morning on Saturday. So I kind of I agreed, but we didn't have to call you guys. You know, I, I handled it on my own, and we got the gardeners to start a little later. So now I get, a le I get, a compl I get somebody who has um, contacted me who's on this body and said that his neighbors just asked if we can change the hours an hour. So instead of them starting at 7 o'clock, let's start at 8 o'clock or, or on the weekends. I didn't think that was unreasonable because, you know, it was happening to us at Dogwood Green. So, and, 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 and let everybody know, you know, I know the garbage, uh, the people who collect garbage, the companies who collect garbage for our town, um, they, um, this is in part for them. This, this ordinance, I believe, that, that Jill... Representative Baguera put in that it, it excludes the garbage people because they have to do it earlier before the buses for school. Um, they can't be collecting garbage when the buses are going around, and then it'll cause problems for you guys. So there's parts of this ordinance that isn't bad. Um, the beach area, we all know. I, I was a guard for, I don't know if everybody knows, when I, when I was a special for the, for, you, for the police department here in town, and I was a guard for a company called G-Force for a while also. And I remember doing, we did the clam bake. We were part for the clam bake. We, 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 we went down um, at that. And you guys did a great job. It, I, I have to, I saw it myself. You contain the issue. It, they, they were in one area, all the students. We bust them in. I was on the bus with, with some of the students from the school. There was, I didn't think there was one, one problem during that time when I was, when I was doing clam bake. So I, I, I not to belate this belating this whole issue, but yeah, let's let's the ordinance that's uh, I, I, yeah. Let me ask you a question, Chief. Are you uh, is, is this ordinance that is this something that you 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 don't want to see go forward? I mean, I don't want to see the officers do anything more than they've already been doing. You know, I agree with Hannah, uh, Representative Gale. You guys are wonderful. I mean, I you know that I I have always appreciated everything you guys have done. But um, the beach area is what it is. It's, it's a problem. Um, I heard that not only it's noise, I heard they're, they're, there's these kids that are going on people's properties and doing damage to people's properties. That, that's wrong. So my point is, is this ordinance, you all, you, everybody here tonight, is this, is this so bad? I mean, can we get some ideas and maybe change a little bit? I mean. Like I said, this isn't cast in stone, right, Jill? It's, it's, you can tweak some of this stuff. I mean, it's not, you know. Well, I've gone a long way to tweaking it in response to a lot of people. And I think like it really is a baby step for what we wanted to accomplish um, at the get-go. And 
the baseline is a lot of this is mostly just being in compliance with state law. And um, I, I do want to say that respectfully, I haven't done the data analysis myself, but in looking at what I know was in the backup for you all, um, in that three years of data, 1,300 complaints, um, the average number of complaints being 436, noise complaints in 2019, which was pre-pandemic, was 366. That's significant. I also think it's significant that we don't really hear from that many people um, as a body. It's gotten less and less since I've been on. Um, we don't even really hear from a lot of people during budget. But we've heard people email us about very specific instances of noise issues that just haven't been able to be resolved by the police and what maybe should be a zoning enforcement issue. It's something that we really need to address. Someone I, uh, that wrote to us um, who's not in the beach area um, but was dealing with very serious loud noise from um, a restaurant moved out of town um, because it wasn't resolved. Uh, it finally is, but I think that this goes to laws speak for who we are and um, the kind of respect we want to give to our neighbors. And um, if we're just disregarding all of this and we don't have a noise ordinance, I think it would be a great uh, disservice to our community. These very minor, basic kind of nuisance laws can help contribute to not going to bigger uh, issues like crazy beach issues at the beach with teenagers. If we start at the small stuff with a noise issue, it's much better than going all the way to very serious things like be breach of pe peace and public disturbance. Um, I think it, it would help our community to keep things a little bit um, safer. You then, Representative Zesma. Thank you, Liz Esma, District 4. Um, further, uh, Representative um, McCormick's statement. Chief, I wanted to just clarify one thing. When you said 1%, my um, immediate reaction to that is that your department would not be overburdened beyond your capacity by having to step up certain enforcements, not that it wasn't worth doing. <laughs> In other words, we are concerned about the burden and we are concerned about the scope of, of any new um, enforcement that you are asked to undertake. So that was, that was my reading of that, and I would like you to at least you know, add your comments about the scope of, of your duties. Yeah, so the, the, the calls for service are historically less than 1% per year. Um, in COVID, it was just over 1%. I think it was 1.02%. Mm -hmm. uh, but on an <clears throat> average five-year basis, which we ran, it was, it was less than 1% on an average. Um, with that said, you know, for any call for service, for any call for assistance, if you call us, we are going to go. And um, noise is no different. Thank you. And then again, um, continuing with uh, Representative McCormick's comments, um, I also think percentages matter. So we have received exponentially more emails, whether it's from 25 people or 10,000 people, in favor of this ordinance versus a couple that have, have been against it. And I would ask through the moderator that if any members of this body are receiving, whether it's a personal email or one email to your district that are in opposition, can you please share it uh, with the moderator? Representative Steele was first. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, first of all, I respect everyone's opinion here. Everyone just has their own opinion on this. That's okay. We all just have a different view, and we're battling it out right now. If you want to say battle, we're discussing it. Um, I do believe data is very important. It's, it's pretty crucial in telling the story. Um, and just, you know, just a couple numbers, and I will have a question at the end of this. Uh, there are 100 towns that don't have a noise ordinance, however you want to take that information. In terms of complaints, we've already looked at it. 
the last three years, to answer um, Representative Zezima's question, I mean, I looked at the, the sheet that I think you all had, the, the complaints go from 475 down to 374, down to 39. They've gone down. Um, that's 888 complaints. And if you look at that over what... Sorry, the, sorry Representative Steele, 39 is for, I think, one to two months of data. Uh, I think that was about three months. But okay, multiply it times four, <laughs> it's 160. That's half. <laughs> But why can't, it why, was in the why light season it? too. There's there's a okay. there's a typical flow okay. of the noise complaints, and okay. it is much more in the summer than it well, is during the winter. That's the data I have in front of me. Okay. So, um, I mean, if you look at that, still the 888. There's a, there's what 55,000 calls per year for the, to the police department. That's like 0.05 percent. It's even lower than what, I'm sorry. Uh, that's funny. I have the microphone. Um, second of all. Um, so that's the number of complaints. I, I've actually had 17 emails that are against this. Uh, that, I'm sorry, that are for this. 17. I counted them today. Um, 17. I've had seven for it, 17 against. So I haven't had an overwhelming amount. Um, so I'm leading to, to a question that is, you know, still this, maybe we lack some of this data, but I'm going with the data I see here, the data I have in front of me. We've already determined kind of where this, this is located, but... So my question is, is it possible to change in 78-6? I, I think a lot of the, the issue could be resolved if we change, if we can, and I don't know, we may have to check the attorney with the other thing we looked at. Can we change the word shale to may? Can we just change the word shale to may? I mean, it's a, a word that I didn't change. It's been there. Uh, okay. It was like that. Um, I just, <laughs> I used what we had. And um, I'll have to go back and look at what other towns have. Um, I, will, I will look into that. But it is what, what we've had for decades. <laughs> and, totally and it wasn't understand. an issue. We've had police chiefs come before us and talk about this ordinance and it was not an issue. So um, there's some kind of new circumstances I that makes see, it an issue. Okay, I just see more and more crime in this town that I'm worried about and just distracting officers' attention to these items where they have to respond to everything is what concerns me. So I'm done and uh, thank you. Low level control can really help to prevent it from getting out of control like that, especially with teenagers. Thank you, Representative Georgiatis. Drew Georgiatis, District 9, the beach area. Um, first, I want to thank um, Representative Vicara. She's worked on this for over 12 months. Uh, she has been um, discussing this ordinance February, March, April, May now June. So thank you for listening to all our requests, questions, whatever. Um, I wanted to, my question is for the police chief. Um, so I just want clarification. Um, earlier you said um, that you needed, that it was an arrest. So if, if, if it's public disturbance, breach of peace, disorderly conduct, then the only option is to arrest. But if this ordinance now uh, reduces that burden, um, the lowers the level, and it's a fine. Um, two questions. Will it, A, number one, um, give more discretion? Because it's easier. If you're going to give a fine, you don't have to have that high bar of arrest. Do you agree with that? Creating a, dub, uh, creating a public disturbance is also a fine as well. The, a lot of these infractions are also fines, but we consider them arrests. Well, arrest is sort of a fearful word. Um, I, I know, but you, you, you and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I think everyone is, is um, using the, I use the word arrest. Anytime we take enforcement action on an individual, it is considered an arrest. Whether it's an infraction, a felony, a misdemeanor, it is considered an arrest. Does the public know that? Is that the colloquial term? That's the, that's the law enforcement term. Okay, I'm just. I just we want, use them every day. Okay, you know, so, no, I just you know. So if you were to if you were to be people. issued a speeding ticket, it's considered an arrest. And based on case law, technically, if I couldn't identify you or other circumstances, I could technically handcuff you and bring you in for a speeding offense. Now it's not something we do every day, but any offense 
of state statute is considered an arrest if we take enforceable action, whether that be a citation, a misdemeanor summons, or a, uh, or a felony arrest. But I think same. you said the pivotal words, um, enforcement of state statute. And so, like, breach, disorderly conduct is a Class C misdemeanor. And um, a violation of an ordinance is very, very different. It's a, it's a completely different level than any kind of violation of a state statute. And, and I, I'm not sure. I would have to look into it. But I've nev I don't know if poli our police officers have the ability to bring someone in handcuffs if they violate our, ordin our town ordinances by state law. I, I really don't know. We can ask the town attorney, but I, I have a hard time believing that. You are correct in, in when you say that a town ordinance is lower. But we issue a town ordinance on an infraction. So it's 7-148 and then the charge that would apply to, uh, in, in this case, it would be the noise ordinance. So uh, on an infraction, which is a state ticket, you would write 7-148, which means in uh, prosecutorial terms uh, that it is a town ordinance and that they are applying that infraction on, or that town ordinance on the infraction ticket. So your understanding is not wrong, uh, but it, it, there's some interpretation that has to go along with it. We use that as the vessel to, to, for the arrest, the, the infraction. Um, and yes, it, you can arrest based on a a town ordinance if necessary. And the fines that we get with the new ordinance, those would go to the police department. So that would be positive. So that is a true statement. When, when we file a town ordinance charge, that revenue returns back to the police department, not back to the town of Fairfield. Nothing comes back to the police department. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. And I also, my final comment is just, um, with we add the daytime hours, I'm sure the uh, number of calls will double. So get ready for that. So thank you. Representative Longo. Hi, Melissa Longo, District 1. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, have you talked to or consulted any landscaping businesses? I know earlier you said that you were going to change um, one of the, I can't remember which number and letter, uh, to more than one person on a property with multiple um, leaf blowers. Sorry, <laughs> it's late. Um, and so I don't know, how does that affect, have you talked to anyone, how that might affect their business, how that might affect their livelihood, how that might affect their day-to-day -day operation? I haven't spoken with any of the landscaping companies about that provision, po potential provision. Okay, I was just curious because I'm, everybody's property is different and just thinking about how, you know, if you have a larger property, even a smaller property that might have a lot of trees in the area, just kind of depends on how everyone's landscape, you know, is different regardless of the size of the property. Um, I would just hate to see hardworking people who are trying to make a living get fined and had the cop cops called on them because they're operating more than one uh, leaf blower on a property. Um, the other question I had was, I know we were talking about data that was in the backup, um, but you did say that besides uh, Ms. Israel's data that there's some that was missing or that you could provide us that you were going off of, or did I there's um, the packet, the one, the twelve-page packet that you should have already, and then there's um, a breakdown from 2019 that I thought had been included in the backup, um, and this is the one that reflects that in 2019, at least, that the beach area calls constituted 29% of the noise ordinate no noise complaints in the entire town. Okay, um, I have. One more question for the chief, if that's okay. Um, are you comfortable with the way that things are running right now? Or is this a really big concern to the police department? No, I think we don't, we don't use the town ordinance anyway. We don't use it. We use creating a public disturbance, which is a state statute. So um, 
I don't want to say this is irrelevant, but I don't want to see this body uh, write legislation that is not only not meaningful, but then maybe handcuffs uh, officers to uh, to impose their uh, lawful authority when it it sh it may not be warranted. Thank you. I still really don't understand how police officers would be handcuffed by this new language when it's almost identical to what we had. And um, so I, I just really don't understand how. My hope is that um, the plainly audible will help the police department to en enforce this in a different way. Um, and I've come to terms with the fact that um, y you don't, you don't use this ordinance, which is a shame. You're not enforcing this ordinance as it's written um, for various reasons, and some of them I understand. But it, it, it is something that was written by a town body that represents the people, and it's something that um, hopefully has reflected what the people want. Um, and from what I've heard, it does, and the tweaks will help be responsive to some people's concerns. So I really, I, I don't understand how these changes handcuff the police. Okay, enough of that. Great, thank you, Chief, thank you, Jill. Uh, we're going to hit the supplemental on the polling locations with the registrar of voters are here. So the reason this is before us is uh, they are not able to come to an agreement on the 10 or 11 polling locations for the vote in November. Um, we need to get this done this month. We don't have a meeting in July. We don't have a meeting until August, which is kind of late for those of you who are going to get your literature together and tell people where they're going to be voting for you. So. Um, so uh, whoever wants to lead off. Um, I want to thank you all for listening to us. You need the mic right up. Pull, pull, it, pull the whole thing close to you. First timer. First time. It's, it's all right. OK. Um, I just want to say that I you know, appreciate all of you and taking your time and listening to this, and I'm sorry we couldn't come to an agreement, but we just could not. Um, it did really try. Um, I thought we were in agreement in all but two polling locations until a few minutes prior to submitting my information to the town clerk. Um, I provided the email chain, which supports this, and my goal is to do what is best for the Fairfield voter. Um, people really don't like change. The phone calls were incessant on election day. People were upset. You know, their polling locations were changed. Um, basically, District 1, um, we have heard from the school superintendent that he is not in favor of using this building, uh, Walter Fitzgerald. Um, same District uh, 6, Board of Education location. He's not in favor of that. Uh, District 8, he's not in favor of Riverfield Elementary School. Um, for District 1, I would like Mill Hill. Um, Matt wants Walter Fitzgerald. Um, that would be a new location. Um, people, they have a current location at Mill Hill. It's convenient, um, and it's familiar to the voters, and I think that's what's really important. Um, I'm sorry. I thought that the current location for District 1 was Dwight. 
It's not the current location. It is a polling place, but for a different district. Correct, correct. But it is, you know, in that area, so. You just have to say it accurately. I mean, it's not the current polling place. Point of order, and Mr. Moderator. She's giving a presentation to the body. If there's questions. Hold on. Okay, hold I, on. I, I, I needed a point current, of information the because that was inaccurate. The current polling place for District 1 is Dwight, not Mill Hill. Mill Hill is for District Correct. 10. And so Dwight, let her proceed with the presentation. Correct. Thank you. I apologize for that. Um, District 1, uh, Matt wants Walter Fitzgerald. And I would like Mill Hill. Um, it is a you know current polling location, but not for all of the people. We did have Dwight, but neither Matt nor I wanted Dwight. Um, there's a possibility that that could be closing, so it just didn't make much sense to me. Uh, District three. Um, I would prefer that everyone votes at one location. Um, I think it would be very confusing to the voters to go and to do, go to two separate places, um, go to, you know, because the state districts are different uh, than the, you know, municipal districts. Um, I did compromise on that because I don't think we really need two separate polling locations or we could just use separate rooms. Um, and District 6, um, I want McKinley. It is just over the border. Um, it's familiar to everyone. Uh, the, the Board of Education building, this is you know a private building, so I don't think it's good to use that. It's handicap accessible, but it's difficult for the handicapped since it's on the second floor. Uh, parking would be a nightmare. Um, and District 8, it's between Ludlow or Riverfield Elementary School. Uh, the school superintendent is not in favor of using Riverfield. Uh, there's not as much uh, parking there. There's only one egress in and out. Um, and you actually work at that school, so you can speak to that. Hi, <laughs> sorry, um, another hat that I wear is I work at Riverfield School. I'm sorry, you are? I am Janice Bulubasis and I am the, the Republican Deputy Registrar. So I can tell you that parking there, it's one way in, one way out. When you, when you leave, um, that's a residential street, overflow, if there's an event going on at the school is on Mill Plain Road. And the sight lines, I mean, I've tried to leave the building when there's something going on. It's very hard to see where you, you have to inch all the way out onto Mill Plain Road. I think I can, I can honestly speak from experience. Riverfield would be a huge mistake. Um, there, there's probably gonna be professional development going on that day. So you have this staff and then you have staff from other buildings. It's, it's hard enough to park as it is with the staff. If you try to put voters in, they'll just, they'll keep going. Ludlow High School is not far away. And there's, play, my kids went to Ludlow High School. <laughs> my son played hockey. I was there plenty of times at all different times picking up. It's very easy to park and access that building. Also, um, this building, we have once a month, we have meetings during the week. It's, Parking's very difficult here during the week. So on election day, I imagine it's gonna be a difficult to park. Uh, would you like to do uh, questions first or should I go ahead? Go ahead. All right. Uh, so, uh, everyone, thank you for, for having us here. Uh, it's, uh, it's nice to be back with you here in person. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the process that we have gone through. Um, within each district, you have to look for use, basically acceptable polling places, places that could accommodate uh, the volume of a polling place. Um, and I looked at probably about 50 
locations around the town, evaluated each one, and uh, something I've been consistent about from uh, when we did this in 2015, when we did this last year, when we talked with the redistricting committee, uh, and again in this process, um, to me the most important factor uh, once you have uh, ascertained that a polling place meets sort of the legal requirements uh, for voting is that uh, you select the one that is the minimum distance for people, that you want to minimize the amount of traveling that people need to do to get to the polling places. Uh, in my backup, I include a little bit of information uh, about sort of the, um, the research surrounding how distanced your polling place affects voter turnout, that essentially the more you make people travel, uh, the less likely they are to vote. Uh, let me, I'm sorry, let me, I, I read that today and I had a question, like how, District 7, Holland Hill, how far away is the furthest voter? Uh, I could get that information to you in like 30 seconds if you wanted it. Um, what I'll say is that in what we now have as District 7, um, there really is only one suitable building in the district that you can even use, and it's Holland Hill. So um, if there were something more central, uh, and I think um, one thing that we've, we've used in the past but is no longer operational is, uh, for example, the Turner Army Reserve, right? That might be preferable from a, like a distance analysis, uh, but we don't have access to it. Uh, so that's, um, there are places where uh, a location might not be ideal in terms of travel distance, um, but you have to take the best one you can, is what I'd say. But I mean, are people driving seven miles to vote? Yeah. You know, there's, uh, I mean, maybe up in Greenfield, uh, way up that way, but most of the polling locations to me seem pretty centralized to the voting population for that district. Uh, I'd agree with that, and, and what I'd say is that um, uh, there are a number of locations where the place that I would personally prefer is not the one that I selected because of that, right? Like, I really uh, enjoyed using the Pequot Library, and uh, I think it's an excellent polling place, but I didn't select it because it is a further travel distance for voters than the senior center, which is what we put on. Um, as we've talked and as, you know, talking to our TM members and uh, other people in the town, everyone has sort of different ideas about what is the most valuable criteria. Some people say, I want all the voting to be in schools. Some people say, I want to minimize the number of people who have to switch a polling place to be the smallest possible. Uh, and I think that if you have a consistent set of criteria that you're applying to your analysis, that uh, there are other uh, ways of looking at the problem than the one I'm presenting that could be valid, right? So, um, you know, if you were to say, well, I think that Mill Plain Road is too residential a road and, and we want to make a, a criteria for disqualifying polling places about the number of people that live there, you know, we can do that. And one of the things that um, we discussed uh, sort of earlier on, I brought a quest set of questions to the Board of Education, uh, who brought the superintendent and um, Mr. Papa George, who I think is facilities director, uh, in to discuss, was you know, what criteria does the school system have that would either limit our access to the locations, that would limit our access to parking, and give us that information so we can evaluate it. And if we want to say, if a polling place doesn't have uh, 40 parking spots, then we're not going to use it, right? Like, you can make that kind of analysis, but I think you have to do it in a systematic way. And so when we're talking about something like Riverfield or Walter Fitzgerald as being uh, unsuitable, they are actually very similar to other polling places that we're agreeing to use, right? We actually voted successfully at Riverfield for, for many, many years, up until 2003. So uh, it's been used as a polling place in the past, and it certainly uh, was never uh, a problem. Every school is going to have professional development, and the question of how many spots are available to us, um, you know, like, I'll say it's McKinley and Sherman, where we hear complaints, we can't find a parking spot because there's too many uh, people here for professional development. And uh, those are polling places that are, you know, sort of on the agenda uh, to be decided upon. So, um, you know, I, I, I do respect that there are other ways to look at the problem to say, let's disqualify some places. But I don't think you can just say, I'm going to decide on what I would like and then try to identify reasons to disqualify the spots that you like. Um, as we uh, sort of went, went through our process and we had sort of four differences 
my pro what I suggested was, well, why don't I agree on these two? Because I can kind of see your perspective on them. And for the last two where we're different, let's each take one of the two, right? That that would be a way to sort of resolve this. Everyone gets some of what they want. Um, you know, not going to sort of a, you know, because uh, look, I'm aware that coming here before you makes us look like giant idiots, right? Like I get it, you know, like I would really rather not. Um, I wouldn't say idiots, but you know, <laughs> it's your job, not our job, and now you've turned it into our job. Yeah, I know. And you know what, if you're only differing on two, why can't you figure out how to get those two, make the decision, and then we don't have to vote on this on Monday night? Uh, or we don't have to discuss it any further. Uh, I think that that's a reasonable idea, and I think that, um, you know... It's the, only one in eight, from what I understand. Isn't that the case? Well... No, it, 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 they agreed to eight out of the ten originally. Now they're back to their original what they want. Okay? That's right. Thank you. Uh, so um, what I'll say is there are two locations where we have where we both have in district options and we're discussing which ones we prefer uh, and that was um, b between Walter Fitzgerald and Mill Hill Elementary uh, in for district one and Riverfield Elementary and Ludlow High School for district eight uh, in both of those cases uh, my selection is uh, c uh, closer to voters on average it's not an enormous difference like honestly, but uh, I think that um, just the way our office needs to work is we need to each sort of get some of what we want, and that's how you right, but move I'm forward. <coughs> Excuse me. For the other two districts, um, for 3133, uh, the question is uh, what does the statute require? Uh, and if you read 9 168 B, you'll see that it says that you must select the closest location to the border of the voting district. Uh, that district, the you know, um, if you measure it, the distance between uh, nine, uh, 3-133 and Woods is about 500 feet, uh, and it's about a half a mile to uh, Osborne Hill. So um, those voters have been voting at uh, Fairfield Woods already. Like that would represent fewer voters being changed from one polling place to another. Uh, it also meets the statutory requirements. Uh, and I, to, to my mind, a, apart from following those rules, the other thing that's really important is that we not uh, run the risk of getting voters the wrong ballots essentially on election day. Uh, so I don't think that it would be confusing to voters because every voter would go to the location that we've directed them to. Um, I do recognize it might represent an inconvenience to the political candidates and such to have like an additional location to cover, uh, which I appreciate and I'm not like unaware of that. Um, but I think that um, the sort of statutory analysis requires that you, you use uh, Fairfield Woods. Uh, for the other location, uh, the Board of Education building versus McKinley, uh, that's an option where uh, I believe there is a value, uh, valid polling place within the district. Uh, Kathy believes there is not one, as I understand it. Um, and uh, I've heard the, the complaints in the past and, and sort of took them at face value that the parking was a struggle here. Uh, I've actually visited uh, the location now a couple of days in a row and have found uh, 300 plus available parking spots uh, available at, at all the times of my visits. Uh, so um, I think that the, um, the suitability from a parking perspective is, is uh, much less of a concern than it was when uh, uh, Save the Children was in the building, which I think um, was a sort of a, a larger tenant that, that used a lot more parking. Uh, so um, I'm happy to sort of take questions about these, talk about the polling places, uh, if people want to know about them, um, but uh, so far as I can see, we're, we're separated by, f by four, and um, if, if there was an interest in sort of making a, a deal between the registrars, I, I'm still interested in seeing that happen and having it come off of your agenda. So just, give thank us, you very much. just give us the ones you agree on, districts you agree on right now. We have uh, two at Burr. 3134 at Osborne Hill, uh, four at Stratfield, and that's an out of district, but we both agree there's nothing suitable in district. Uh, five at Ward High School, uh, seven at Holland Hill Elementary School, uh, nine at Sherman Elementary School, and 10 at the Senior Center. So we're talking about one and Three, one, thirty-three, and eight. Six. And 
Representative Vergara. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll, I'll just start with this clarification because um, I think that one issue that wasn't explained really well to everyone is the issue of ha having not having a suitable polling place in district. Can you just give us a list of all of the districts that didn't have a suitable location in district? Um, from what I can tell, it was D4, which you put in Stratfield and you agree. And then it's D1, it's D3, 133rd that doesn't, okay. And six doesn't have a polling location, but there's a discrepancy between the registrars whether there is a suitable location in district or not. That's correct. Okay. And are, are those the only ones that are uh, polling locations, that, uh, districts that don't have suitable polling locations in district? Yes. Okay, thanks. Representative Longo. I didn't, on. but I, I don't completely understand. I'm so sorry, Representative Longo. I, I don't understand completely the implications of not having a suitable location or determining a suitable location, um, whether there's a suitable location. So, um, Mr. Wagner, you said that if there is no suitable location in a district, the statutory, the state statute requires that we pick uh, the closest polling place to the district line? Is, is that a statutory requirement? That is, yes. Okay, so it, in that situation when there's no suitable location in a district, when you're picking it outside, it has to be as close as possible to the district line. Uh, that's correct. 9-168B is the reference, uh, located okay. as near as possible to the boundaries of the voting district for which designated. What happens when the registrars don't agree that there's no suitable location in a district? Well, uh, the RTM would be able to choose uh, any location within the district that you find suitable. You wouldn't be required to choose the one that I've identified, but you would. Can it be out of the district? Can we choose one that's out of the district? Uh, the statute requires that both registrars must agree that the location, there is no suitable location in the district in order to select one outside the district. Okay, and the one that you don't agree that um, doesn't have a suitable location is six. That's correct. And you think it should be at the BOE headquarters and um, Ms. Politi thinks it should be at McKinley. Uh, also correct, yes. Where it's been okay. for a long time. Yeah, I have to say, I, I agree with Ms. Politi on that one um, because I think, you know, when you were describing the different issues, I, I, I understand that there are a lot of different things that you consider. Um, you're considering proximity to the voter, which is important, and I can see how it relates to turnout. Um, it's also what, what's the current polling place and um, amount of disruption. Um, and for that reason, I, before we vote on this, if we have to, because I'm praying that you come to terms and can figure hash this out, but um, I want a list of the current polling places. Because for me, if the polling place in District 1 is Dwight, I, I don't understand why we would move the voters who've been voting in Dwight out of Dwight. Um, and then, then there's these complex issues of out being out of the district and picking it closer to the line. So that's... Is, is Dwight out of district for District 1 now? No, it's not. It's in. It is within District 1. Um, the voters who had previously been served by the Dwight School um, are now sort of half of them are in District 1 and half of them are in District 2. So uh, we have new districts, so people have sort of been rearranged as to uh, what place yeah, they're Mike, most near. I, I know, because we used to vote in seven, now we're voting in nine, so. And I just want to say for District 3, I'm actually fine if he wants to do Fairfield Woods instead of Osborne. I'm, I'm fine with that. So we can knock that one off? Thank you. Well, well let's get a clarification. At one location? For, I mean, it's a split district. 
they're doing they're doing yeah, I would prefer it's just one location, though. Just 3133, but 3134 would still be at Osborne Hill. Right. No, she, Wait, no that's not I, what she I said. I would prefer, yeah. She just said. Just, yeah, have one location. Two rooms. So you're saying you're giving up, you're giving up Osborne Hill and going to Woods? But uh, the current. For both. The current location for D4. D three is it's woods. It's, oh, woods. It's, it's woods. It's woods. Okay. Uh, Mark, I don't. That, that seems like it solved a big problem right there. Hold on, hold on, everybody. Make sure they know what they're saying. Yeah, I I I, I do too. D three votes where today? Oh, last election, where they vote? It's a woods? different. It's a different district three. District three. It's is okay. The old D two. District 3 is one of the most radically reconfigured. Uh, it's now in the 134th, whereas District 3 had previously been in the, the 132nd. Right. Um, so two what I'd say is that uh, Osborne Hill is, like District 3, 134, does have a suitable polling place within it, right? So moving the voters of 3, 134 outside of district when, when there is a suitable location in district wouldn't, wouldn't be appropriate. On, a, so on you're election, I'm you're sorry. You're saying two different locations then? Oh, that's correct, yes. You are, Matt. But that's not what Kathy said. She said she'd agree to the. I don't think the statute would allow you to move it to an out of district location if there's a suitable location in the district. Uh, you could um, cause them to vote in one location in even years and a different location in odd years. Uh, that's something that Fairfield, uh, a lot of surrounding towns do that, but that's something that Fairfield has uh, historically avoided. That would cause a lot of confusion, I think, to the voters to switch well, we're, polling we're, locations. We're not voting on any Senate state races, right? Uh, not in this year. Right. That's correct. Isn't it supposed to be within the RTM district? Uh, Suitable location in the RTM district, right? Uh, so the, the term that statutes use is voting district. And any time you have a unique set of uh, people or representatives that uh, voters vote for, um, it is considered a separate voting district. So the fact that we have a split district where a portion of District 3 is within the 133rd and the majority of it is in the 134th uh, means that uh, as a function of law, we have 11 voting districts, uh, as we did in the last decade and uh, previous to that as well. Representative McCormick. But for purposes of the election coming up in November, which is what you're picking the polling locations for, there is only um, there are only ten districts that people are going to actually vote in pursuant to their RTM districts. Correct? Uh, yes, and and I agree that um, for odd numbered years uh, you could. I'm have just a speaking about location. November, just, right? Just for this November. What I'm up. saying is that you would want it's to odd number year. Uh, you know, um, I don't think we all want to be back here next year, so I think we would want to make a, a, a designation that would, would stand on a permanent basis till the next redistricting, but you certainly could have everyone vote in one location this year and have them vote in two locations next year, and that is legitimate, and I wouldn't uh, argue about that if that's what you wanted to do. And, and you would admit that having District 3 voters vote in two different polling locations can be confusing to the voter, correct? Uh, I wouldn't think it would be confusing to voters. Um, I, th I think it might be uh, an inconvenience to uh, the, the candidates and political parties and things. You don't think it would be confusing to the voter? Uh, no, because the, the voters know very little about their district numbers, right? We, we tell them, we mail them a letter that says, here's the location where you vote. The candidates come to their doors and tell them where they vote, right? Like it's... Have you had people show up on election day and say, I don't know where I'm supposed to vote because I used to vote in this district and now I'm being told to vote in that district and why did you change my polling location? Uh, that, that, that happens all the time, every year. That is, that is a part of our lives, is okay. helping people who have uh, shown up at the wrong location. Okay, yeah. and you're, you're aware that Walter Fitzgerald is located down a fairly 
uh, long road in a residential neighborhood where these folks who live there are now going to be strapped with having to deal with the additional traffic considerations of uh, having all the voters from District 1 coming down that street, you know, as if it, it was beyond what they might be expecting for a regular work day at that school, right? Certainly, yes. Okay. And it's also, um, I actually did a map quest on it, and it's three minutes from Mill Hill if you drive by car, right? That sounds right. Okay. And it's 0. 0.6 miles, right? Uh, that also sounds about right. So you're insisting that we use Walter Fitzgerald is a change to what Mill Hill has been used in the past, and you're doing that to uh, accommodate a three-minute or 0.6-mile trip for somebody that might cost them an extra three minutes of their time, right? Yes, I'd say so. Okay. And with respect to uh, District 6, this, this would probably be the physical space where the uh, election equipment would be set up, right? Uh, that's correct. So, and um, we've, I, I made a reservation for it to make sure it would be available to us. Okay. And, and so people would have to park their car, right? And they come up a set of steps to get to the front door, right? Uh, there are parking spots um, uh, adjacent to the, the elevator on the lower level, but uh, people certainly, some of them would certainly park in the front, I imagine. Right, and you can't see the lower level from when you pull in, when you pull in the parking lot, right? So they have to come up this big set of steps. They've got to walk into the lobby area. They've got to come up the Point elevator. Point of order. Can we, what are we trying to accomplish here, uh, Yeah, let's. Um, the bottom line is that this is a huge imposition to a voter that might have yeah, some potential. Um, let's, let's, just, let's just, let's just, let's just cut it is. because uh, I, I, you know, the, the superintendent is, is not going to allow voting in a couple of these places. So um, it's what it's going to come down to. You're, you're going to have a meeting with him this week. Hopefully, from what I understand. He, um, uh, I, I asked him for information for the purposes of disqualifying polling places and if there were any they thought were unsuitable in April, and, and he responded that we should just make whichever reservations we preferred uh, at that time when I asked him. Um, his uh, uh, sort of new opinions about what locations uh, voting should or shouldn't take place in is, is something that uh, I'm not, not uh, aware of the, the basis for that. The message that I received for him was that he did not think that uh, voting at uh, Walter Fitzgerald and at Riverfield were necessary, that he didn't think it was necessary to change the polling places, but it, he didn't say that they were not suitable or that he wouldn't allow it or anything of that nature. Uh, and you know, certainly everything he represented to us and to uh, the Board of Education um, sort of was the opposite of that up until uh, whatever he conveyed to you, I, I guess. The email chain clearly says that he does not want uh, voting at Walter Fitzgerald, Riverfield, and as of 9.32 this evening, it's also uh, the Board of Ed, he added. Representative Bateson. I'm sorry, I just want to clarify, the superintendent has that authority? Uh, well, probably. Okay. I, 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 all right, I, that's, that's pretty relevant information, guys. I mean, so, I just... I don't think you know, so. I don't, I, think, I don't think he does, but, you know... I think if it's a suiting... If a suitable it's been spot, determined by our registrars that it's the suitable polling location, it has to be made available. That's my understanding of it. It can't be I shut really, down. I really he, he, don't he can, want to get in their sandbox. He the can superintendent have, is saying he doesn't want something he, somewhere. He can have his opinion, but I would say he has authority. Okay, we're going down I another street there, guys. Representative Zesma. Thank you, Liz Esma, District 4. So just to clarify, do all schools have a professional development day on Election Day? Court, but they don't have to, I, I believe they don't hold the professional development at each school. Sometimes you'll have a school like Riverfield and let's say 
first, second, and third grade teachers from surrounding schools will go to Riverfield. So I believe that they're not all using the building. They use certain buildings. No. Just, I don't know for a fact, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so we can ask that question. And I also am confused, um, as is Representative Bateson, what authority the superintendent has in selecting polling places. Um, and then my last comment is, you know, obviously I think we're a long way from, you know, walking away with a list. Thank you, Matt, for all your work on the statutory issues. I don't think any registrar in the state of Connecticut knows more than you do. But I understand and I hear there are other considerations, you know, for, for each. Um, and, and Kathy, I, you know, appreciate you making a concession because otherwise we were, from what I could see, we were looking at a situation where it was a give me 100% or you get nothing. I don't think there's a precedent in this town where one registrar got 100% and the other registrar got nothing. My focus is on the Fairfield you have Kathy, you have to put that up to your mouth. <laughs> my, fair, my focus is on the Fairfield voter. Right, I'm just saying, but it is incumbent upon you guys to compromise. Compromise doesn't mean 100, you know, to but zero. But if that's bad for the voter, then I would have to go against it. But is that your opinion that it's bad uh, for the voter? Drew, you don't have the floor. Representative Longo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Representative Melissa Longo, District 1. Um, if you know that the superintendent does not is not in favor of you using any of these three polling locations because it's my understanding that he does have authority, especially during daytime hours. Why are you making it difficult? If he is the one who you're consulting with and has expressed his, you know, him saying no to these three polling locations, I don't understand why you would go against that authority, especially when he does have it during the day. And if I'm wrong, I would like to know. But from my understanding is during daytime hours, he does have, he does have the say or the final say. Uh, is that a question for me or? That's a question of how do you know that he doesn't and I'm saying he does during the day and my question is if why would you go against the superintendent and what his wishes are? I don't understand the point of making it difficult. Uh, well first I guess I would say I reached out early to the superintendent to ask for what they would find to be disqualifying in the use of polling places, uh, ask very explicitly those questions, uh, and was met with a response that we should choose whatever locations we wanted, right? So um, I'm not trying to work around the superintendent and sort of the district's like needs and prerogatives. Um, we need to choose suitable polling locations, and if they have information that would tell us a location is not suitable, uh, I asked for that, right? I asked for it in March. I kind of annoyed them a little bit by asking for it a lot, right? Like several times, be like, hey, do you have an update for us? We really want this information. Um, so, like, I appreciate that this is like, a, that he has expressed a preference, but uh, I haven't seen anything from him that says, no, you can't use those. He said, I don't think that, that these particular locations are ideal, and I don't find it, I don't see a need to move them. Uh, so, you know, the question of, you know, which locations is he talking about when he says, I don't want you to move them. Um, I've only seen one very brief message from him with no rationale. And I do think if we wanted to evaluate polling places on the basis of what parking is going to be available to us, right? Like, what are these factors that we can look at and compare and say, okay, this one's really not going to be in use because, you know, it's not the whole parking lot's going to be full. Like there will be no spaces available to us. That's information that I do think that we can take in and listen to and make considerations on. But when I asked the district for that information, they said, uh, "Just pick what you want." Right? That was that was what they said to us when I asked for that stuff. Did the superintendent? I'm sorry. I'm just follow up. Um, did he say because he is? And I'm just curious to use the polling locations that we have typically used in the past so as not to confuse voters? Uh, he didn't. He, I mean, that's something that, that someone might think. Uh, and I would say that if we were going to choose locations that, we, that would minimize changes for voters, a number of the things that Kathy and I agreed to, you would pick a different one, right? Like, 
using Burr means that every voter going there is going to a new place, right? Like there are a number of things that are like that where we're changing everybody when we don't need to. And you know, I think what matters to, to me is that you have a rational basis for making these decisions uh, because when voters do call and complain and they say, why do I have to drive past the school that's right near my house to, to go to a different one, we can tell them those reasons and defend it, right? And say whatever, whatever those, the basis was for making those decisions that we can uh, tell voters, here's why it was decided that way. Uh, and that's you know, the, sort of the day in, day out of the office is having those conversations with people. Okay, so I guess he didn't advise you or he did not say to just use the locations that we previously used? Just, just curious, because I didn't get a yes or no out uh, of that. He didn't say that to me. And I'm also seeing that there is a, um, I think that there is some professional development and something going on in the Board of Ed building on that day, and I, I, I personally agree with Jill, my, about not having it here. I just think it's kind of, for pretty much I agree with everything that Jill said about not having it here. I don't wanna repeat myself, but I think that if you guys can find a compromise on at least that location, just going by from what we're all saying, that would be extremely helpful to us. So thank you. Representative Steele. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I'm gonna give you my two cents since we've been here this long and I feel I, I wanna do that um, and I'll be quick. Obviously, you're operating on the premise of let's make this as easy as possible for the voters, number one, right? And in creating the least change for voters, right? That makes sense. Um, I, I think even if the superintendent doesn't have authority, as Mr. Bates in question and others questioned, his opinion probably matters here because we're using his schools or the schools that he manages and oversees. I think that means something. It means as much as what our opinion is, probably means a lot more than our opinion. So I think that needs to be taken into account. Real quickly, if you can do one school, if, if there's a way to do one school for two voting locations, that makes a lot of sense. Less staff, less maintenance, less you know school facilities you need to use. One goes to one room, and sir, you go to that room. It's very simple. If you're smart enough to vote, you're smart enough to go into the right room. Um, real quickly, this place would be a little ridiculous to have a voting location. It's a private building. Um, this, why would we do it here? And let alone the parking lot's full, and it takes, it'd be very difficult to get up. Uh, lastly, please don't base it on distance when it's a 0.2 mile difference or a 0.6. My voting district changed from St. Pius to North Stratfield, for some reason I don't know, I think because we're not allowed to have churches as a, as a hosting location, but now we travel six miles away. We still vote. So to make it that, that in this case, uh, uh, Fairfield Ludlow is further than Riverfield, and that's the only reason, because all the other reasons don't make sense for Riverfield. Fairfield Ludlow High School has been a voting location. It's a big place. There's a, plenty of parking. It's many entrances, exits. Why would we change that? I'm getting passionate because it's ridiculous. Um, that's really it. But uh, just think of the voters. Thank you. Representative Pastilli. Sharon Pastilli, District 3. Um, part of what the voters expect from us is compromise and to be able to govern. And so governing is not getting 100% of what you want. Um, I do think <clears throat> that it would be better to have one polling place for District 3. I'm a former district three person. I do think that there have been parking problems in the past. There were parking problems in the past at Woods because of professional development, but we cited that and I believe that uh, professional development was moved because there, was, there were one or two years when we first started voting at Woods that it was very clogged and that I think once we establish what the polling places are, the parking issues can be um, fixed because you're gonna pick a different school to have professional development at than you are where someone's voting. Um, and then the other thing is the superintendent of school should not be picking our polling places. So I understand that this is, you know, during the day he has control of the building, but there aren't students in the building. And this is about our democracy. And so I don't know that Board of Ed would have oversight over that. So I, I think we really just need to compromise and um, not drag. Whether they have oversight or not, they have preferences. Okay. 
Um, just let me let me say I do appreciate that uh, that reference that um, based on uh, essentially constituent complaints, the Board of Education was willing to move professional development from one school to another, and I think that that um, you know my to my knowledge, uh, every teacher went to PD at their own school, and if that's not the case, I think that gives the district a lot more flexibility to basically clear way for polling places wherever they may be. So that's that's something that's information I appreciate. One other thing, just because it keeps coming up as a reference, um, it is the Board of Education that has uh, authority over the schools, and, and it uh, statute is 10-239, uh, uh, re requires that uh, they make uh, voting available to uh, the elections department uh, on the, um, you know, s subject to whatever restrictions the board may provide. So we ask them for whatever restrictions and uh, my request to them, uh, asking them what would be unsuitable about a, uh, any polling places coming up was sort of using that language to say what restrictions should we observe in selecting polling places that you might uh, dictate to us. So that's observing restrictions until after there's a, a dispute and then weighing in after there's a dispute, which doesn't seem appropriate if you were told at the beginning that there, there were no unsuitable polling places. The one other thing that I agree with, with Representative Vergara, um, and I think Representative Steele, is that we want to know um, like the path of least resistance in terms of the least number of voters that would change polling places because I think that we could uh, solve the tiebreaker pretty easily that way. The least number of voters that have to move, period. Th that, I think that would solve the problem. Um, I agree that that's a rational criteria, but you would select a number of places that are different than what Kathy and I had, had chosen. No, only based on where you disagree. Representative Zesma. Thanks, so I just want to clarify, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm leaning more in favor of the Board of Ed building that we're sitting in right now than not, but what, where exactly within this building would, Here. just this room, right? Okay. That's correct. Um, and I realize that it's the only in-district, is that what I understand? Uh, there, there are a couple more options uh, that, w that we could consider. But should it be deemed unsuitable, and I know that's a a broad category and one that we're not all going to agree on. Mill Hill is the out of district alternative. McKinley, McKinley I'm sorry. I'm getting my M's confused. Um, you know, we did have St. Pius was not in district at the time it was approved over great objection. And so I realize that there are times that there have to be, that, that compromise has to be made, but I just want to confirm that you believe this facility could handle I, from I, the entrance to the parking to I, I do actually the the travel distance for voters is is much less than at a number of other locations um, so I, I feel really good about it from that perspective but um, what I will say is that uh, st. Pius being chosen out of district was um, you know that was something that was done it wasn't a product of compromise that was uh, in 2015 we we differed on four and uh, you know, there, I've, I will say that I have never actually, in uh, any of the three rounds of polling place selections, uh, had a partner willing to compromise on ev even a single location. 2015, 2022, and now 2023, I have never had one situation where someone had said, I'm willing to trade one spot for another to, to get to a point where we don't have to have a debate. So um, I'll say that having St. Pius and I, I have uh, no objection to using a, a, a church uh, for a, a voting site if it's, it's suitable. That's, that's something I think that people say, but it certainly doesn't bother me. Uh, the, the problem was it was out of district, and not challenging that legally is, is probably my uh, greatest personal uh, professional regret uh, as a registrar is that uh, I allowed that to go without challenging it in court. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you for that, and it's time to break the curse. That started whenever, 2015. Representative Bateson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, reflecting on what Jeff and Melissa were talking about, I've been thinking about the BOE in, you know, I don't want to get caught up in, you know, semantics of this, that, and, but 
when it comes to these buildings, I'm going to rely on what the superintendent and people like Angelus recommend because they know how the buildings are being used. I don't know where PD is, professional development is on election day. So if these guys are saying they don't want something in a certain place, I'm going to listen. I would take their advice strongly. You guys mentioned that you were referring to something that you received correspondence just recently that I, I don't know what you're talking about. What was the latest you've heard from the superintendent? Uh, it was at 9.32 this evening. I Can you read that, please, if it's not too long? I, I, I want to know what, what 9.30 this evening? Matt, did you get this, too? Yeah. I haven't been looking at my okay. email, but maybe. I, I want to hear what it was said. Okay. Can you read? Hold on. Let me scroll up. It, it Thanks, Mr. McDermott. I am happy to have a discussion to come to an agreement with the registrars. Is that the one you're referring to? No. no it says, you got another uh, one? It, yeah. It says, <laughs> Maybe there's another one. It's from Mr. Testani. I cannot agree to the BOE building for oh, a couple of reasons. First, the district is using um, this on election day. And second, I don't see how an office building is conducive to voting. I don't see how it is a better location than McKinley School. Yep, that's the email. That was 9.30 this evening? Uh, Correct. 9.32. 9.32. I'm sorry. Are there other emails like this? I mean, I, I'm uh, dealing on limited yeah, information here, guys. There's, there's uh, an email chain that I provided that... Yeah, I got that, but you're talking about more tonight. Uh, just that one from 932, yeah. Mr. Moderator, the, may I be recognized? There is another email, and it was sent at 4.04 p.m. to Mr. Wagner and Ms. Politi and some other... Can people. I hear that one? It says, good afternoon. I want to be clear that the proposed changes to voting locations are problematic and do not work for the school district. The district has professional development for all employees on election day. This is common practice, and these changes will hinder voting for the members of the public. It is my understanding that these changes are being brought to the RTM for discussion. I'm requesting that no further action is taken until we all have a meeting to discuss these proposed locations and the rationale behind the changes. Sincerely, Michael J. Testani, 4.04 p.m. today. Okay, I, I make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Pretty much says it all to me, guys. All those in favor? Hi. Uh, one thing, sorry. Um, I don't know, Ed, if you sent it out, the. Um, hold on. I've been asked to uh, remind everybody about the age friendly, Fairfield friendly. Uh, survey that's out there. Um, it ends on June 30th, so please try to fill it in yourselves and have your constituents uh, fill it out. Um, it's on the town website. Um, it's under Age Friendly Fairfield, and it's a survey. Okay. You guys have all have fun next week, because I'm not going to be here. <laughs>